We are tonight's entertainment. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Excellent! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Movie Mania podcast. Now, as you all know, uh, we can't give anyone's names here, so we're going to use some aliases. I'll be Mr. Jedi. You, you'll be Mr. Brexit. And you, you're Mr. Tired. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tired. <laughs> I'm so tired. I'm trying really hard to think of something funny, but my brain's just it's not working okay. that fast. So <laughs> I was gonna call you Mister Sorry because you like Terminator Genesis, but I'm like, let me take advantage of the fact that <laughs> it's got three Mister Pops. <laughs> and you, you Mister Pops, because you like Genesis. That's why. <laughs> all right, everybody. Uh, this is movie mania podcast. How are you guys? Uh, how are you guys all doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah, Good. doing okay. I just finished my last job. I uh, just yeah. got my first on-screen TV broadcast credit today, if you were watching in the UK. Wow. Channel 4, 4 p.m., The Question Jury. Look out for the credits. Um, anyway, yeah, so that happened today. What did you do? Happening. Uh, I you... was part of the production crew. Oh, right on, right on. What about so, you, Bandit? Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing, Bandit? Um, nothing, really. Bandit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you're well, still tired. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, I was I was up late finishing a video last yeah. night. I wanted it to be uploaded before this started, but it, it didn't have enough time. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so once we're done, I'm well, going to upload and go back to bed. <laughs> well, can you well, since, since this video is going to be up? Since this video is going to be up before this podcast is up, can you tell us what the video is? Yeah, it's it's why Ghostbusters deserves to die. <laughs> oh, we're going to get to that in a second. <laughs> uh, I've been doing I've been doing okay. Um, I. <laughs> Look, I don't want to get too political here, but good lord, <laughs> some horrible things have been happening here in the states. Some not five hours away from where I'm currently sleeping. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it's all been a little, a little, a little crazy here in the states. But uh, that's right. Here's I, I messaged that. you and said if you want to hop a jet to Australia, you can come crash. With yeah, me. I'm thinking I'm, I'm, it's in my plans. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you know, I'd offer come to the UK, but um, our economy is not great right now. So yeah, I, I had to knock you off the list, Joey. I'm sorry. I mean, you no, can. I can't. <laughs> I'm going to go to Canada. I, uh, but you can. I am tempted. I, I am tempted. My One of my cousins works for Disneyland, so we can get tickets in. <laughs> we could live there. Live in Disneyland. <laughs> in Disneyland. Apparently, working in Disneyland is awful, but that's neither here nor there. All right, yeah. anyways, well, guys. Hopefully, hopefully, we can like take everyone's minds off all the events and put a bit of light into the darkness for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Because, mm. yeah, it's, it's been an intense last week or so over there mm-hmm. in America, isn't it? It's like mm. <laughs> over the course of, like, five days, there's been all these I know, stories. Like, Pokemon Go gets launched and just you can't get away from it. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Pokemon Go gets a silly really good shot. Oh, boy. I'm telling you, I'm, I'll, look, all I'm saying is that, officer, I'm just looking for my Pikachu. I'm not doing anything else. With that being said, let's get to the movie news. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. Cannonball! <laughs> All right, so this is the movie news, guys, in which case we talk about all the stories that have come out along the last week in the movie space. Uh, for starters here, the early reviews of Ghostbusters um, is out, and apparently they are getting uh, – everyone's saying that the movie is, you know, okay to good. Some yeah. are even saying it's great. Uh, early reviews, that they, it's at like 75% Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, apparently everyone's really enjoying it. So what do you guys think? Yeah, it's um, it's it looks like it's looked like yeah, it's a solid sort of B B rating, like a B minus sort of thing. So it's just a shame that Sony decided to be like total a holes and go after everyone <laughs> online. <laughs> That's why I'm making a video going. To be them fair, <laughs> everyone went after them first, and now Sony shouldn't have retaliated. But I can I can in that since I understand why Tony why Tony why Sony got a little <laughs> little upset that about the whole idea because. Literally everyone was attacking them, whether it be someone saying the trailer sucked to people sending, you know, you know, hate comments and, and slurs to the actors and directors. That's right. But, yeah. They got trolled but, like by genuine trolls on yeah. like uh, Melissa McCarthy and I think the director as well. Both mm-hmm. got trolled pretty bad. But, Which you know, what, what, what I take issue with is that they delete all the negative comments on the video except the racist and sexist ones. Yeah. And then they turn around and say, you're all racist and sexist for not liking this trailer. Yeah. That's why I said the video. The I'm like, I, no, I said, you I guys this, created that because that's the I said this last week. 
I said this last week. Yes, it was super shady and super and super stupid for Sony to delete the legit criticism, which which there was legit criticism. The marketing campaign has been pretty poor, but then people only being upset at the comments removal and not being upset at the racism and the sexism. You can be angry at two things at the same time. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. There is still racism and sexism in the comments. I but like, they listen, went I, after angry video game nerd too. Because he said he's not going to bother to see the movie because he knows he's not going to like it. And they're like, he's a racist, he's a sexist. And it's like, he didn't even mention the gender thing or the race Out of interest, did did Sony and like the uh, the cast and crew themselves say anything about James Rolfe? I I saw media outlets say stuff like that, but I didn't see actual people involved in the movie say it. Did did that happen? I'm 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 not trying to call you out. I'm just asking. I don't know. No, no, no. Well, like, yeah, like the articles were like piggybacking off it. But, um, mm. like, Peter Feige said, like... Uh, Paul Feige. Paul Feige. Uh, Paul Feige, Peter sorry. Feige. Sorry. <laughs> Peter Feige. <laughs> Peter Feige. Feige. Good old cousin Peter Feige walked in the room today. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, he, not, said, he said everyone online are the biggest a-holes, like, ever. He said that. And then Melissa McCarthy was like, are oh, there all these basement-dwelling losers, blah, blah, blah. So they sort of painted in broad strokes everyone. But okay. yeah, <laughs> but, but no, it, like, like his... Lewis McCarthy didn't specifically go. I hate angry video game nerd. <laughs> Here's the thing about the reaction to the positive reviews. Have you seen Reddit over the past like 24, 48 hours when the review started yes. to come in? I was and about they, to jump in been, on that. Yeah, there have been about concerted, how... organized attempts to try and downvote every positive review of Ghostbusters try and claim that Sony is bribing all of the critics saying that they are not giving um, negative reviews because they're afraid of SJW backlash whatever that means anymore social justice warriors so people that are confused (laughs) Um, and And, and here's and here's the thing right so what sucks about this is that I think I saw one review, I think it was uh, pretty much it, and they gave their opinion on it. And I saw, you know, a, a typical review of, of someone that has, a, you know, a few thousand subscribers, you know, 400 or so likes. And I, lo- and I looked over and it was like 256 dislikes. I'm like, what? This is this is kind of the reverse situation of something like Man of Steel or, uh, or Batman v Superman, where, and which we'll get to that in a second. But where when you – they posted the reviews and people who have not seen the film yet are reacting to – to it besides saying oh you think the movie's good well i think it's i think the movie sucks even though i haven't laid my eyes on it so i'm gonna download this review on the other end of the spectrum you i can't remember the guy's name i don't know he's a smaller youtuber but he posted a review that was like um ghostbuster surprise it sucks and it's sexist and stuff but in the video he's like i've not seen the movie somebody has sent me a plot synopsis Mm. from it's a reputable source and i'm going to review the movie in totality based on that plot synopsis which may or may not be genuine and like it's 90 percent upvoted the video yeah like the obviously. confirmation bias is out of control and listen i saw the movie this afternoon shall we save my thoughts for later or in homework or shall i just spell it out now uh, which well, one? I have a lot to save, talk about homework. Homework. So we can, we can... homework. Well, I have a lot to talk save about homework. homework. I guess it's but either work. way, the backlash, either way, ain't worth it. Yeah, Did busting yeah. this movie make you feel good? <laughs> <laughs> it's not changing well, was, the movie. I was kind of indifferent <laughs> about the movie. I didn't really care one way or another until they started to go after people. But see, the mistake they've made is they've tried to troll the internet. And you're never going to win that battle. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> It's, it's I think like, there's fault, is, on, there's are fault people, on both sides. Are people hating, you know, is the internet hating on the trailer wrong? Yes, but they're not professionals. <laughs> uh, but when you get, um, but when whenever you get a trailer, like, say, Illumination Entertainment's Sing, like, that trailer has everything wrong with movies uh, in it. Sorry, again. <laughs> and, there's no, and there's no downvote campaign for that. I'm just saying, maybe pick your battles better. That's all the furries, Trilby. And once That's you see that, the... that, that, that pig mom dance in the supermarket. Gotta see that furry snail. Gotta, Gotta see, see them snail. rabbits shaking their butts. Matthew McConaughey is a koala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I just, really? I feel, I, yes. It looks I, so I, it's, bad. It's, all, it's coming out on Christmas, too. I'm like, come on, guys. You're going you're gonna to try to rally against Star Wars with that? Jesus right, deserved luck. better than this. <laughs> our lord and savior is upset he deserves better than koala mcconaughey <laughs> hashtag McC- <laughs> 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 oh, 
right. <laughs> you know, most you koalas what. have chlamydia for some reason. So what? <laughs> it's true. I don't know why, but somehow they all <laughs> have know chlamydia. Why? It's because they get as he gets older, and they all stay the same age. <laughs> <laughs> There was some boy band that came to Australia and got pictures with chlamydia and like one of the koalas like urinated on him and then he like had to get checked to see if maybe he got chlamydia from the urine. <laughs> and he's like, man, if I, he goes, if I had known that, he goes, I would never have touched the bloody thing. He's like, this is going to be a really awkward conversation with with my <laughs> with my girlfriend back home. Going to be like, yeah, I have to listen, get tested listen, for chlamydia Sarah, from this Sarah, koala. She'll be like, that's the worst lie ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's like, Sarah, I was in Australia and a koala scratched me. I got to get tested. She's like, why? I'm like, because koalas have chlamydia. <laughs> you know, Come on, up. babe. He sounded like McConaughey. <laughs> <laughs> you can say no to that. <laughs> I loved failure to launch. Is he it- drove a Lincoln. <laughs> we can't do this again. We did, we did McConaughey talk last week. <laughs> <laughs> Right over at kangaroo with it. No, okay, no. It was the most erotic moment of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was we're the, doing callbacks. In comments last week, there's just like a bunch of this, like this most erotic podcast of my life. I got, there's like 15 comments of just that. <laughs> like, oh. When I used to, when I used to co-host Film Brits and the episode titles would have just been out of context, random gibberish. And that yeah, would have, if I wasn't, if I was naming the episodes, that, that would have been the last episode of the Movie Mania podcast. <laughs> if, if we ever get t-shirts, we could, <laughs> we should put, put that on that a t-shirt. Shirt. Most erotic moment of my life. <laughs> Just so that nobody will buy them. <laughs> and yeah, but he's I think it's like, like, that. like McConaughey koala drawing uh, Rose from Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to them having sex in a Lincoln. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> next story. Not safe for work t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that story here. Uh, a quick story that I feel like we should go to because we should acknowledge it. Deadpool 2 starts shooting next year. And I think it's set for a 2018 release date or 27, one of the two. Uh, so it starts shooting next year. Obviously, we're all excited for it. I'm happy to see you. I, I, wasn't, a, I wasn't the biggest fan of the first film, but, uh, but I'm excited. Like I said before, I'm excited to see where the sequel goes now that we, can, now we got the origin out of the way. And we don't have to worry about a boring romance again. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you share the same sentiment? Yeah, I like it. Um, I think okay. that because uh, because at the moment Kingsman Two is filming at the moment, so I like the idea of having a Kingsman and a Deadpool movie like alternate the years. I think that that's a, that's a yeah. really good slate for twentieth century Fox, and that helps them bring in like additional revenue streams. Deadpool is one of the most successful movies of the year financially. Definitely one of the most profitable movies. It, if it yes. wasn't for the fact it didn't get released in China, we may it may have outgrossed Batman v Superman. Yeah, it, well, it, it was it was, it was that close. Yeah. Yeah, because Batman Superman did like what eight seventy eight million worldwide, and Deadpool was like close to eight hundred. So yeah, yeah, they had that China money because China loves loves movies like that. Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. United mm-hmm. instead. Okay. Speaking of Batman v Superman, I'm actually yes. working my way through the Ultimate Cut, and it actually is much better. <laughs> We're gonna get to that in the homework section. I have All a right. lot to say about the Ultimate yeah. Cut. Yeah, I, I, I uh, okay. Um, next story here. I sent you Trilby. You probably haven't seen the trailer. Then I sent mm-hmm. you guys a link to the trailer for the movie Goats, which stars Nick Jonas and James Franco. Yeah, uh, for these I guys. It. Yeah, we'll be yes, waiting. So I, <laughs> yes, I made sure that Bandit yeah, watched uh... it. It's okay. Uh, well, let me get to, let me let me run you through the plot unless you want to sit sit aside and watch it for a few minutes. It's only like a two minute trailer. What's it called? Goat. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll check it out. You. The trailer's over. Feel free to just edit that me watching it entirely out. But yeah, I think I will. <laughs> what's I'll include what's, it at the end or something like that. Yeah. What, what's Please the point of that Please include the line of Bandagoy that I dropped out of car. <laughs> that light's killing me. And uh, yeah, they'll have like a record scratch and the trailer audio stops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, let's anyway, we'll drop out of college. <laughs> let's talk about. I look, I'm still in high school. Let's talk about the goat trailer. <laughs> oh, Trey, you've got all of that to look forward to by the looks of it. I'm not. I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not an idiot. So, um, what do you? <laughs> what do you? What do you think about the trailer, Trilby? Uh, it just seemed like a lot of loud noises, um, basically. The, I don't know. There's, 
I don't know. Clearly, there's a lot of critical acclaim. It was accepted at Sundance. Um, I'm just looking at Wikipedia now because film journalism uh, reviews seem to be good for it. But it just seems like another like Project X, like MTV frat boy movie. Mm. I don't know. No, it, you it, sure it, that wasn't the MTV introduction that they did beforehand? Um, possibly. Yeah, that may have that may have swayed me a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, it just seems like um, just it, it's. I think it's trying to be like an art house project X, and I don't know if the two are compatible. That actually doesn't sound like a bad idea, an art house project X. Um, tell you what. Yeah, yeah, Spring, Spring Breakers. Truly, I'll talk about the trailer. <laughs> I think it looks great. Um, I, Nick Why Jonas, did you make I us haven't watched seen that. It looks so. <laughs> It looks like a pretty because, bland movie. Yeah, I was, look, I was. Are you getting like trailer. paid from them or something to promote it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I tell you what, I heard about it and I figured, well, why don't we talk about? It? I like, I like the trailer. I, I look. I apologize for making you guys sit through the two and a half minute torture that apparently was this trailer. It's yeah, not it wasn't too bad. It's just, I, I was expecting something more after you, you singled it out for the podcast. I was, I'm, I was impressed by it, and I was, I'm actually very much looking forward to it. Tell you what, we'll save it for the homework section when I see it in two months. That sure. being said, <laughs> Disney's to release a three-minute Rogue One trailer. Um, I have some issues. <laughs> Uh, they announced last week that they're going. You know, it's time for we. It's oh, it's time uh, for them to release another Rogue One trailer because we're all clamoring for it and chomping at the bits for it. And apparently, it's going to be three minutes long. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, what Comic Cons are on the corner, and so Star Wars Celebration. So it makes sense. Yeah. Well, Celebration, I think, is I, I think it's this upcoming weekend. But there do we think do we need a three minute trailer to a Star Wars movie? Yes, because the very last shot of the trailer is guaranteed to be Darth Vader. So we you just think need it, to hear him breathing for just like that extra thirty three seconds. minutes without Darth <laughs> Vader? Like they're, 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 they're gonna, we're going to wait two minutes and fifty seconds before we get Darth Vader in a three minute to movie be, trailer. To be fair, the Rogue One's got a big supporting cast of characters that are completely original. Uh, like yeah. the, you've, you've got all these new uh, rebellious re- rebels that need introducing, and you've got to sell the rebels. idea. Re- rebellious rebels. <laughs> uh, so you got you've got to sell the idea that this is in the Star Wars universe, but it's not connected to the episodic chapters. So I think a three-minute trailer, like, you've seen how how much that the um, t- trailers and TV spots for the last Star Wars movie just blew up the internet and got and broke records. So yes, it's going to get and traction. also gave you the entire plot of the movie if you were careful. Um, I saw videos of people that said, you know, every Star Wars clip in order, and then, you know, and, you know, I didn't watch them from, from, from what I was told, you know, they pretty much got, you know, from the opening scene to the final scene without Luke Skywalker, of course. Um, so I'm just, I'm just concerned because Disney is prone to releasing things and giving away too much of the film. Like, we're going, the, the movie's not out till December, and we're already getting, we're getting a three minute trade. Like, we didn't get. We got taste in like bits and pieces of Force Awakens until like September and October hit, and then we got like thirty trailers and fifty mm-hmm. clips. And at that, by when it was all said and done, we we got fifteen minutes of the entire film when you put it all together. And you know, we're and it's not even September yet, and we're already getting a three minute trailer. Yeah, just me, but so. at the same time, you got to remember that like. Like this, this movie is about them stealing the the plans for the Death Star, and we know how that story ends. Yes, <laughs> so it's, it's like we well. can't give away that much, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I, I think because uh, the, the the narrative surrounding Rogue One is that it's a production in trouble because of the reshoots and stuff. So I think Disney want to try and course correct and damage control to a certain extent. It's like they did that whole Entertainment Weekly thing a week or two ago, when they've yeah. they've released they released the news about James Earl Jones and Darth Vader, which which was rumored, but now it's been officially confirmed. So I think they're just trying to just get the the hype machine back on track, and I can't blame them for that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the trailer. All right. Well, I'm happy you guys are on are on different side of this. I just I don't I'm know. I feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the YouTube comments, but I, I just I it's, like I said, Disney's been prone to release a lot of the film before it's out. Um, but speaking of damage control, let's get to the homework section. This week, each one of you has a homework assignment. You're going to go out. You're going to start a fight with a total stranger. You're going to start a fight, and you're going to lose. All right, guys, so this is the homework section of the show, in which case we talk about the films that we have either been assigned to see or have just gone out and seen on our own. Anyone else would like to start? Did you guys see anything this week? <laughs> um, I saw um, a little That's not often told. I love, I, I, I love the cough mm-hmm. they had to escape. I, love, I was like, <laughs> you guys see anything? I didn't see her. 
<laughs> well, he's dying in the corner. <laughs> no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I saw a little, not often talked about movie uh, called Ghostbusters because it came out in the UK today. We oh, got yeah, it like five days that, before America. That indie flick, that indie flick I've heard about. I, I hear it. Yeah, I hear I, it's that, a- yeah, it's had no internet buzz or any sort of traction online. I don't know. Don't know what's happening with it. No, either way, See, the, film. The question is, how sexist are you, Trilby? We'll soon find out based off your rating. <laughs> I am that my best fork ready. <laughs> I am the most sexist. I got the most sexist points at school because um, yeah. it's clearly a competition. Uh, no, <laughs> Ghostbusters was pretty darn good. Really? I was actually su- I, w- I was surprised at how much I liked it. I was hoping for a good film. I was hoping for a good passable film. I actually got something. I think it's pretty special. I don't think it's like going to be a five star surpass the original film. I don't think it's going to be like a game changer or anything, but it was a really good comedy. I've not laughed that much in 2016 so far. I consistently laughed. Even the jokes that bombed in the trailer were making my screening laugh and making me laugh. The effects were surprisingly good. The cast were really good. Chris Hemsworth, my goodness. He's yeah, I've heard that. He's I've heard so that. funny. <laughs> like, like this the, one of the like one it's just making me laugh thinking about it when he's trying to pick photos like which one of these photos makes me look like a doctor this one of me playing a saxophone or me listening to saxophone and he's got a <laughs> saxophone next to his ear <laughs> it, it, it's I, i'm not trying to spoil all of the humor but there's tons yeah. of stuff like that there's there's a lot in this film. The I'll just get some of the negatives out of the way now. Um, I won't go into spoilers. That will be next week. But there's a lot of homages to the original. There's a lot of cameos. The cameos and homages themselves are okay, but the frequency was pretty annoying. There's a cameo or a reference like every ten to fifteen minutes. Um, there's like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man makes a brief appearance. You've seen it in the trailers, but he comes so out of nowhere and doesn't make any sense in the context of the scene, even in regards to the franchise. He just comes say, out of nowhere. He really came out of nowhere in the first movie too. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. but even even here he doesn't. And, and there's a moment where um, the Ghostbusters get a piano thrown at them, and before it gets thrown at them, it plays the dun 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 dun. Like, like that, that just came out of nowhere. Just stuff like that that just takes you out the film. Um, I also think that the villain um, was a bit weak. It like, wasn't a bad villain. I think I understood where they were going with him, but I think it needed more development. But the positives far outweigh the negatives here. The cast are great. Uh, Leslie Jones is actually really endearing. Kate oh, McKinnon, though. Kate McKinnon as Gillian Holtzman... I, she's not in the movie enough to be overwhelming, but she walks away with this entire enterprise. And forget like Holtzman being the best Ghostbuster in this film. I think she's the best Ghostbuster in the franchise period. I think she's one of the best characters this franchise has ever produced. And oh, all I, right, honestly. That's an ambitious <laughs> phrase. Remember, Trilby, we are still going to actually do the movie next week, too. <laughs> we are. It's we are so don't, giving, don't say everything. But but... <laughs> I won't say everything, but it was really funny. They had some great like fist pump hero moments that I really enjoyed. Younger audiences, I think, will like it. What was interesting in my screening today was that it was quite a busy screening, but the age demographic for the male viewers was like 18 to 30. The age demographic oh. for the female viewers was about 8 to 6. Yeah, I heard. I, th- I heard there are a lot of little girls going to the screenings dressed up as Ghostbusters and stuff, and a lot of older women. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's great. Like, forget like a lot of people. Like, I've just dismissed this movie out of hand. And if you think it looked bad, then fair enough. But I think some like specific um, audience members are going to get a lot out of it, and it is. It's a really fun time, and in a summer where we've had such underwhelming films like Independence Day Resurgence and and a few others that I guess, like mm. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, to see Ghostbusters actually like answer the call, so to speak, and just provide a fun time at the movies and just an enjoyable and heartfelt one, yeah, color me surprised and incredibly humbled. This is like right, the Paddington so. of 2016. 
in that oh it looked bad. Wow. It was really good. <laughs> well, Bill, Bill what Murray, we... Bill Murray said it drags on in the first first act, then it picks up later. <laughs> not not uh, in the first I, act. The, I think the first act worked. It was in the third act where it got a bit baggy, which I'm a bit well, concerned. Tell you what. Tell me because they've announced a, a, they've announced because an extended cut for Blu-ray. We've got to. So. We've got to. Can we've got to? We're gonna get far more into detail. We can let you keep talking about this next week. Um, yes. But what? Tell me. Sent. Bandit, should we save what he gives it out of 10 for next week, or can we do that now? I'm asking you. Um, I don't mind, if you want to. All right. What do you, want, what do you, give, what do you give it out of 10, Shelby? I'm going to go for an 8. All right. Yeah. All right. It's, better, it's not as good as the original, but it's better than the sequel. Okay. Well, then, wow. well, I'm probably seeing it Wednesday, hopefully, if my screening doesn't get full for some reason. Um, if not, I'll see it sometime this weekend. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, well, Sony a- should be sued for the bad marketing. <laughs> yeah, I think they're just they're they're not a good film studio right now. Okay, that's Ghostbusters. If you don't Should we talk mind, Ultimate Cut? That's what I was gonna. Let's get jump yeah. into the the Dawn of Justice Ultimate Cut here. I, I I'll if you don't mind, I'll go first. Yeah, um, go for it. Okay, so I uh, this morning I was I was going through things. And I was like, you know what, I probably should watch because we got like we got a couple tweets, we got some YouTube comments, we got some Facebook messages. We were like, I should watch the Ultimate Cut. And so I sat down and watched the entirety of the Ultimate Cut. And I'll say this in the same way when I first watched the original, the theatrical edition, um, I, I said wow, this first 10 minutes is awesome. I can now mm. say that after watching the ultimate <clears throat> cut, I think the first hour is awesome. I think that really? it's, it, it, it's incredible to me how cer- just small bits and scenes can fill in so much. I feel like if Dawn of Justice was like, Dawn of Justice is the first, the theatrical, it's like, it's like making like a, a tower out of popsicle sticks or something or, or a thing out of popsicle sticks, like some kind of construction. But the glue wasn't there. They hadn't glued everything together yet to make it stick. And so everything fell apart with just the slightest bit of, un, you know, of, of mm. wrong turns made everything go, go down. And now, Dawn of Justice, it's like they added the glue, but the glue hasn't fully dried yet. So <laughs> it, all still, it also kind of slumps over and just kind of limps to the end. <laughs> but... But it, but it's a much better film in the sense that a lot of things flow together a lot a lot easier. Jesse Eisenberg, I've come to the conclusion of why I think about this character. Oh god, he I is that guy. He's fantastic in his role, and I think he's a great villain. <laughs> but he's not Lex Luthor. That's and that's the problem. Yeah. Like because he's if you told me, I think I said this back in March. If you said this is the Riddler or Maxwell Lord or some other character like that, I'm like this is the best character in the film, obviously. But he's playing Lex Luthor, and that's not what Lex Luthor yeah. is. I know. Has I, a, found, I found like I don't know whether these were just extra bits in the ultimate ultimate cut or whether I was just noticing them more. But he talks a lot more about his dad in this. Yes, how his yes. dad grew up in East Germany, he had to fish through new fish through the garbage to find newspapers and yeah. blah 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 blah. And I'm like, I really want to see this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, I want to see that Lex. That I feel Lex like they're setting fantastic. up. I feel like they're setting up because they even they even they mention they bring it up. It's just you know, if Dad was still here, and then I'm like, I'm and I'm like, are they he setting up the fact that he's he like, might, you know, maybe he could appear? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm like, are, is, are they are they setting up for him to come back? And because that'd be great. But I just and so the Jesse Eisenberg bit was great. But the thing that makes this movie work more of the Ultimate Cut is everything with Superman himself because. You know when everyone when when all the reviews are coming out, and everyone was saying, "Man, this movie feels so cut together. This movie, everything is feels so empty." I think mm-hmm. the main thing that was empty was the Superman stuff because he only he only got like what forty lines in the theatrical cut. I'm sure he I'm sure he gets more in this version, and he yeah. he gets a lot more to do. You know, he goes out, and he actually does without giving too much away. I guess he actually does reporting stuff, and he actually he actually talks to people. We see people in Gotham think about Batman. We mm-hmm. get to see different things. It's incredible how just like the the timing of things work. Like they like they'll add like there's a scene at the very start where Bruce Wayne's going through the wreckage of Metropolis, and even in the theatrical, I love the scene. But I, there were certain questions like, what is this little girl doing out doing outside of the building if her mom's all the way on like the top floor? And then you realize, oh no, she was probably part of like the company daycare because you see a bunch. You see this woman taking a line of like th- of like thirty kids or something, you know, down the street to get them out of the wreckage. You're like, oh, that makes more sense. Mm. It's just, it's little bits and pieces that make the movie work a lot better but yeah, go ahead man. like i i found like i haven't watched it all the way through it yet but so far yeah like it it does improve it like 
like you see things like uh, where Jimmy Olsen gets killed. Yeah. And you see KGBs like flamethrowers the body so it looks like Superman heat visioned everyone. So like yes. little things like that make mm. sense that didn't <clears throat> make sense in the movie. But <laughs> see like when the reviews came in from this, I thought it sounds like the ultimate cut is a fresh coat of paint on the Titanic. <laughs> you know, makes it look a bit nicer, but it doesn't change the fact it's got this huge gaping hole in the hull and it's sinking. But so far from what I'm watching, it's more like um, like a whole interior decorating thing of the Titanic. Well, if you want to use your Titanic... Substantially, but it doesn't change the fact that it's sinking. If you like, want to use your Titanic metaphor, I can I can say that it's like... like let's say the Titanic hit the iceberg... But it's barely able to make it to shore. I think that's just how I looked at it. I, I, I don't think the movie still sinks completely, but keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah. But, um... Oh, God. What was I going to say? Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so like, yeah, like, using that Jimmy Olsen bit at the beginning, like, sure, it does, like, all the extra stuff in that that he's actually mentioned, Jimmy Olsen, that does help that whole scene go down better but it doesn't change the fact that you don't need any of that at all because you've already set up the reason why batman doesn't like superman with that cool bit where he's driving through the destruction you don't need this stupid conspiracy you don't need Mm -hmm. any of it you know so it's like it improves it but it doesn't change the fact that it's you know built on this shaky foundation already at least that's what i see so far but yeah it definitely is an improvement i don't think anyone could deny that but yes. it's it's still like it doesn't fix the movie as some people <laughs> might claim that it does. It kind of does, but it's like and like I said mm. in my metaphor of how the glue is still kind of drying. Um, it, it all still kind of falls over in the end, and and by the end, that I mean now that we have the ultimate cut, I can definitely say we did not need Wonder Woman or any kind of Justice League connections in this film. I can de- as someone because the movie's three hours long now with the with all the added scenes and and that just makes them the movie starts to feel very long when we have to still see Wonder Woman check her email and look at the different uh, yeah. Justice League files. Yeah, she, has like, watch, she has to watch the trailers, the Justice League. Yeah, movie. she has to watch all the trailers with the posters and and yeah. the nightmare sequence. Great in the theatrical cut because it's it's a breath of fresh air in, in both action and style, but. Yeah. Now it just feels completely out of place. The Flash stuff is still... The Flash portal cameo is still odd. The Doomsday fight, I think, still atrocious. You, can, you still oh, yeah. can't see anything. Yeah. It's, it's all just a bunch of lightning and, and nonsense. But it's but, like... I, I, sorry, go, go on. I'll, I'll I, I was going to say, but I... But I the Martha bit is what I was going to give up, but we'll get to Martha in a second. You you make your point, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say like, <laughs> like when uh, when the Weekly Planet that's thirteen percent of our podcast talking about the Weekly Planet. <laughs> what what? But when, when they uh, <laughs> when they mentioned the um, when they were talking about it, uh, you guys will probably remember um, Mr. Sunday. He's always like, "You've constructed a better scenario," like that, and you can still do that all the way through this movie. You can, in every situation, you can construct a better scenario of everything that should have happened. Like, yes. again, I, I only just watched the Jimmy Olsen thing, so it's in my head. <laughs> but, like, I was like, when the <laughs> guy, when the guy points the gun at Jimmy Olsen, pulls the trigger, you don't see the bullet hit him, he falls down. I was like, wouldn't it have been better if, like, that happens and the terrorists, like, roll Jimmy Olsen's body over and there's no bullet hole? And they're like, where's the bullet? And then, like, Superman appears and he's, like, holding it and he's, like, right here. Like, he caught it or something <laughs> like that. And I was like, wouldn't that be better? <laughs> like, and you I can do still like do the that. Bit where like it, have you gotten to the, you can still you do that the all the way with, through. Yeah. Did you get to the part with the drone and, like, the drone's about to take out the town and then you see, like, and he Superman? Blows, did, yeah. He yeah, I loved that. I loved all that. I was like, oh, that's a great introduction to Superman. I do like your idea, though, of him catching the bullet. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, it, but- it, it, Let's get to the Martha bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, Why do you so, say that name? Yeah, so when he, so when I watched the movie back in March and the Martha bit happened, I, I, I it's like BFD, I stood up and was getting ready to walk. But I was like, no, let's finish watching. I'm at a birthday party. I can't just walk out of the theater. So I sat through the rest of it. But in this version, it works just a tad bit better 
solely because I, I'm not sure if they added, I, but I, I feel like the way they shot it just made it look, it, it felt a bit more emotional and a bit more intense. Maybe it's because we got to see more of Bruce Wayne in, in, in this role or in the ultimate cuts. We got to see some more of him in it. Uh, and I don't know. I just, I, I felt like the, Mar- the Martha bit did not bother me as much because I felt like I knew what they were going for because Mm. What essentially what they're trying to go for is oh this man this alien this foreign thing has a family has a mother has someone that he loves and cares about and so that kind of what snaps Batman out of it but that's not really mm. conveyed it would, what re, what what is shown in the film is that Batman and Superman have the same moms so they become best friends you know they have the same yeah. mother name so they become best friends but I feel like what they were trying to go for is oh Batman suddenly has a sense of compassion for Superman because he has a mother too and he doesn't want he doesn't want to have to lose another Martha in someone's life if you will and this, I feel like what, I knew what they were going for so I was able to buy it a bit more yeah it's still really they're, they're, stupid though. I guess they're trying to portray that like. He's an alien, but in that moment, like Batman realizes, he does have humanity, so he's not a threat. Yes. So yeah. thing because he he pins Superman down and says, um, "You're not a god. You're never even a man." Yeah, um, yeah. and, and I then think... he's like, "Mom," and he's like, "Oh my <laughs> god, you are a man." <laughs> 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 well, exactly. Now that I was on a repeat Martha. viewing, on a repeat viewing, now that I was you know prepared for the Martha bit, I actually think it was handled better than I gave it credit for. I still don't think it was good, but because I was just thinking, why would he say why would you just call your mother by her first name to a complete stranger? Yeah. And then what I realized what, what I realized I think they were going for was that Superman has admitted defeat he thinks he's about to die and he thinks okay, well I've tried and reason with this guy if he's going to kill me, I'll at least say save Martha, save my mother, Lex has got Martha, my mother. Mm. So like, because otherwise, save my mum. Who's that? Save Martha. That's like that gives you a specific person to look for. Yeah, if yeah. that makes sense. I, it's actually for Batman can be like, who's Martha? And you're like, oh well, now that you're listening, yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's I think that that's what they were going for. But yeah, like, like it's the, it, it makes it a bit better, but again, doesn't change the fact no, that Batman like, yeah, should no. know that already Absolutely. if he actually yeah. did some detective work. But well, they had the, the thing, there's a way there's a way to do Martha and have it work. And there, and I think and I think in a better made film by a better filmmaker or excuse me, a better storyteller because I anyone <laughs> anyone anyone <laughs> other than Zack Snyder. Um, that Martha bit could have easily because how ridiculous could it have been that the whole you know you either you either uh, die a hero or live long enough CSO become the villain thing from Dark Knight that mm. if that was handled wrong that could have been so hammy and stupid and ridiculous but because the way they did it in the film Dark Knight it works and suddenly you have the motivations for these characters mm. but so Martha could have worked if it was done better by a, someone other yeah. than Zack Snyder. <laughs> I, I, you had people on Twitter when the uh, when this cut got released, like apologizing to Zack Snyder, saying this has totally fixed the film. Um, I, uh, I no, originally it gave it, <laughs> yeah, I, I gave it a half star out of five in my original review. <laughs> if I were to review it again with this in mind, maybe one star. It has doubled the rating. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, well, like, I gave it. Couple- a- it's, like, it, it's it's three hours long. No matter what story you're telling. This should be a really simple story. Bat- uh, Su- Superman partially destroyed Metropolis. Batman's pissed. He goes to fight him. You don't need all of this convoluted stuff. This does not need to be a three-hour story or a two-and-a-half-hour story. Mm. So it, ca- it can only go so far. But there were a few small moments that I did like that I don't think were in the original cut. I, I can't compare them side by side. Like when... um. Uh, Lex Luthor is on the roof with Superman before uh, before the big fight happens. That's my favorite scene in the movie now. That's my favorite scene. Yeah, when he says like, like when he says there was no uh, man from the sky to save me from my father's fists and and stuff like that, but yeah. then when he creates Doomsday, Superman is right in to defend him against Doomsday, who's about to punch yes. him. Mm, like yes. that was actually a really nice visual beat. Um, yes. And it's, it's stuff like that, which it far from saves the That's movie. True. I didn't it, think it, of that. Yeah. It's just a couple of small yeah, moments. I was it's a caught up of... being like, <laughs> why did he create this thing? And then immediately yeah, tries right. to kill You're him. Too... <laughs> I didn't catch that. Yeah. He's, he's over there like, <laughs> yeah. well, he's like this and this would be better than me. i like, but I, I feel like going back to that scene on the rooftop, you know, it reminds me of, <clears throat> Going back to Jesse Eisenberg as like as quote unquote Lex Luthor. You know what? I'm just gonna call him Lex Junior because that's the only way I can get Diet Lex. <laughs> Diet Lex. That's Diet Lex because it does sound like him. a soda, doesn't it? 
<laughs> Diet Lex, because Diet Lex himself is great. It's just not Lex Luthor, so I'm just going to call him Diet Lex. Um, so it, I think Diet Lex, now after going back and rewatching the Ultimate Cut, he is actually what gets, what helps me get through a lot of the slower, more dour bits, because this movie's very dark. This movie's far too dark. After, after going back and rewatching him, one of my main problems with the film is that it's very, it's very boring. It's very depressing at times. It doesn't need to be. Um, you can be sad and be dreary when you need to be dreary, but it, it, what was I getting? Okay, so the, uh, the Clark Kent's in the mountains, and he goes and talks to his father, Jonathan Kent, and we hear the story about how he got his hero kick and drowned horses. When you watch the theatrical, you're probably you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Why does this have to do with anything? And then you go back and watch the ultimate cut and you realize, you know, this might actually have something to do with morphing because I don't want to give away what happens in the ultimate cut bandit um, because you're still watching it. But there is Superman. Let's see. How can I do that? Spoiling things. They do some stuff with Superman at the courthouse that very closely relates to what happens with Jonathan Kent in that story he tells in the mountains. So that now that change I appreciate it the most. Yes. The, now that that's, those courthouse changes. Yes. Because what, what happens both before and after that scene building up to the courthouse explosion, by the way, felt very dark night. And I loved it because it felt very tense. And like the way they cut between things, I think it was, it was like, if they kept that in the original movie and cut out the nightmare bit in the flash bit, you could have, ah, anyways, it's just a bunch of the movie could have worked and just, it just kept, like I said, the glue wasn't dry yet. Yeah, I, I I still think that the movie was kind of broken from its very foundation. So no matter what you added or took out and changed, it would still be broken. Like if you've seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you can't build a castle on top of a swamp because it will just sink. <laughs> I built the swamp. Stone of justice. Built another one. And then, that the then swamp. it fell into the I, swamp. I did the I ultimate cut. That, that bird dad fell over, then fell into the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's that. That's probably going to be Justice League. Yeah. yeah just going to be. Justice. Bird dad fell over, then fell in the swamp, but the fourth one stayed up. <laughs> Suicide well, Squad yeah. stayed up. <laughs> what about the Flash? Well, that one stood up. Uh, <laughs> we'll find out in a month. We'll find Aquaman out. Aquaman surprisingly month, stayed up. <laughs> Why? Well, because Zack Snyder didn't build it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I gave, I gave the, the original the original cut. I gave a four. The theatrical cut. I'm gonna go ahead and give this one a six and a half out of ten. Um, well, that's quite. I'm I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it to fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, just because you realize what they were. I realize now what they were trying to go for, and I like what they're trying to go for. There's just so much that bogs it back down. Yeah, um, there's still there's still some issues just inherent with it, like how um, the the Trinity don't even communicate or strategize oh. when they go to fight Doomsday, mm. like oh. remotely. That like, bothers it, it, me because like Batman and Wonder Woman, I think we're having. Oh, also speaking of Wonder Woman, awful. Now that I've seen the Ultimate Cut, <laughs> yeah. I've seen awful. Just. Her lie. I feel like I feel like just off screen there was some guy with the cue card. I feel like she was having a hard time remembering her lines. Her tone was the same way the entire through the entire way through. And the character of Wonder Woman's great. Gal Gadot not has not sold me. She's got she's getting a movie next. Was it what is it June? So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that, we're expecting that soon. That's that's kind Although of Although she she looks she looks good in that um, Keeping Up with the Joneses movie. Have you seen the trailer for that? Yes, or she plays the um, like the the uh, like the spy family or whatever with the, the spy. Uh, Who's she married to? John Hamm. John Hamm. Yeah, it was John Hamm. It's, it looks pretty yeah. funny. Um, but yeah. hopefully, so hopefully she can me over in that because right now as Wonder Woman, she is not looking good. I mean, she looks well, she's good. She's looking in the costume. good. She, yeah, she's looking good. <laughs> she looks good in the costume, but as an actress, woof, that was like but, I think there was yes. one line where she just like. Some boys don't like to share. I'm like, no, come on, more emotion. She was talking like Shay from Game of Thrones, banded if that <laughs> anything. I'm like, I'm not buying this. Yeah. All right, whatever. Yeah. 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 Well, I I got to finish watching it before I can, you know, score it or whatever. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it's sorry, certainly sorry. like. Uh, like I said, the theatrical cut is the worst movie ever made. I stand by that. The ultimate <laughs> cut definitely is not the worst movie ever made. I could say yeah. it so far, cut but I've got to finish the, watching it first. <laughs> the Ultimate Cut is officially now not the worst movie of the year. That that now goes to the BFG. Mm. <laughs> but anyways. Yeah. But uh, you, you but, have- I, like, I draw a line between the theatrical and the Ultimate Cut, though. Yeah, that's true. I, I see the ultimate cut as a DVD, not as a theatrical yes. release. So <laughs> because they did not, they did not regain. I feel like if they would have given us the ultimate cut, though, I wonder how it would have been received. Because I feel like I, I wonder if they released the ultimate, if they released Batman Superman as the three-hour version, 
how would people I feel like it would have been received the exact same way. You know, I feel I feel like people still would, it wouldn't have been enough. I feel like it's only because we've gotten the garbage that was a the theatrical cut, but now that we have something slightly better, uh, an, an actual improvement that we can actually call it an actual improvement. I don't know. That's my theory. Mm. That's placebo effect. All right. <laughs> and final thoughts? We can move on. No. Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> the movie's right, still pants, so there's just a lot more of it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more that's pants. Just, that's Mr. Sunday's review. He was just like, look, the movie's still awful. It's way too long. Um, okay, so did you guys see anything else this week? No, not really. All right. I'm, I'm, I was meaning to see the BFG, but I didn't get a chance. Good, 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 good. <laughs> <laughs> Save yourself some money. Okay, so... <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing I'm it Friday. Come. No regrets. Good. Whiz pop, whiz bang. <laughs> Makes the bubbles go down. Okay, so I'm going to talk about movie. So I saw this movie, uh, this little uh, little small indie film that I think uh, a lot of you are going in. I know after the goat Charlie Roll, you think, oh my god, what's Charlie Roll? I'll recommend all these indie films. But this one is, you know, it's quite good. It's up for a contest right now. I hope everyone can check it out. It's called uh, The Christmas Detectives. And, uh, and it's... <laughs> I love Chubby's little squeal he just did. <laughs> Someone animate that. <laughs> I like to imagine like he's like a kid on Christmas. It's so I saw the Christmas detectives. I'm not going to review it because I'm biased, obviously. Um, but I, that that is the name of Chubby's short film. And it's currently on, as we said earlier. You can all go and vote for it. Uh, Chubby has a video about you. No, Chubby, why don't you tell him? Because I'm just. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, a few months ago, you may remember I had to take a week off the podcast. That was because I was making a short film uh, called The Christmas Detectives, and it tells the true story of what my dad did uh, with, with the Humberside Police on Christmas Day 1985. Um, and um, you can watch the short film, the uh, Christmas Crime Comedy Caper, at um, awardio.tv, awardio.tv, and you can vote for it uh, through Facebook and or Twitter. Do both, because it will help me out. And at the end of the week, uh, whichever film on that website has the most votes wins. Uh, so hopefully, next time we record a podcast, I could be an award-winning filmmaker. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, so put yeah, all, that... I'll put all the links below in the description. Next so to the timestamps, which we've not told YouTube, people about. Click on those links <laughs> and vote for Trilby's. We're yeah. not rigging the vote. What are we talking about? <laughs> no, we're not about. It's like it's like second place got sixty votes. First place got three hundred and ninety-five votes. I don't know how it happened. Uh, you know, we have some connections. <laughs> yeah, <we're>, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, check it out. And uh, the the um, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, though, uh, the response that people have uh, given to the film has been pretty like really humbling. I wasn't I wasn't quite sure what the reaction to the film would be because uh, I'd n- I'd only shown like a select like few people. I showed Bandit like a few weeks ago. Mm. Uh, Trey, I think I sent you it. I don't know if you have if you saw it nope. earlier but you saw you've seen Never it now seen. when it counts i watched awesome. it an hour ago so yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. friends forever actually truly um, did, did you change the name of it because when you sent it to me it was it was called uh just christmas day so have you changed oh, the that, name or was that, it just um, different that, on the file um, yeah, that was just the final name. the The name was always the Christmas Detectives. Okay. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, but people have been. I've said that they found it really good. It's cl- it's clearly a guerrilla, no budget short film. Like it's meant to be set in 1985, but some of the cars in the background Brilliant are clearly acting, not. Though. Especially I, I, from <laughs> the guy playing your dad's younger self. Oh, oh, amazing, I wonder, amazing. That, oh, yeah, that <laughs> there's that such a William similarity is, to my dad. He's he's going places. He's like the British, you know, Leo, you know, Leo DiCaprio. He's got <laughs> he's got a sense of like you know confidence to him. I wonder if he does anything on the internet. I gotta check him out. Anyways, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. See, um, originally for that role, it was that guy or Chris Hemsworth, and I just thought that guy's clearly much better looking. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, that William guy lucked out because he's not in Ghostbusters. Hey, oh, um, hey, oh. <laughs> his yeah, audition yeah, was you... great. It's almost like he knew exactly what you wanted from the performance. <laughs> It's like he was inside your head. <laughs> but, but yeah, in, the, all, the budget... in all serious though, I do like how um, you, you went you went kind of Ant Man on it, and how when sometimes uh, without giving too much away, someone will be talking in modern times, and someone else will be talking in nineteen eighty five, and the li- and the lips will kind of sync up Ant Man style. And I'm like, oh, I really like that storytelling device. But whatever, um, it's good. Good job, by the way. I quite I yeah, quite it, enjoyed it. it. Yeah. Thank you. It's only like six or seven minutes long, so. Check it out in the description. Also, vote for it if you could. You've got a week to vote for it. The voting ends uh, Sunday, the seventeenth of July, so uh, you've got time to vote for it. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you better, for that plug. 
it'll, it'll be far <laughs> better than my short film that I'll be showing off in about a month or so. We'll get to that on another time, though. Um, I think that's everything I've got here. I saw the big short, but we can save that totally in another time. Uh, let's get to our feature presentation. And now, our feature presentation. We're doing Tarantino. Okay, sorry guys. I just that song. It's it's they play it in Reservoir Dogs. Hooked on a feeling, and it's always like I I, I love <laughs> that song from Guardians Quentin. of the Galaxy. It's, it's, yeah, the, it's always music. Like his yeah. <laughs> his movies are just as musical as they are visual. <laughs> exactly, mm-hmm. and it's it's so riveting. Uh, all right, guys, we're doing we're doing the films and the style of the man Quentin Tarantino. Uh, you guys have been asking us for us to do this for quite some time now. We're finally giving it to you. Can I wait for you guys to be disappointed? Um, who we, we feel like it feels like we've kind of already done it, but that's because we've talked about Hateful Eight and Pulp Fiction both quite extensively. Yes, yes. well, movies mm-hmm. I think we both very much enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, so who wants to go first? Do do you want to do, like, overview thoughts first? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, then, on, who wants to go first in their overview thoughts? I'm going to take a swig of water here. I'm thirsty. Um, my throat's dry. So. <laughs> I'm just here with my nice cup of tea. Just, you know, just able to talk for hours. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> the guy, he's... <laughs> I think, like, looking at... I sort of strategically picked different movies throughout his filmography because... um yeah, also just based off what I haven't seen of his. But yeah. I think his big sort of breakout hit was Pulp Fiction. Everyone sort of knows him for Pulp Fiction. Uh, Reservoir Dogs was like a cult classic. That was like an unexpected hit. And that's what got him, you know, uh, the job to do Pulp Fiction, which put him on the map. But that was such a such a big hit that it cast a shadow over his career for a really long time. And I've heard yeah. him mention in like interviews and stuff before that he was really kind of worried about what he was going to do after Pulp Fiction because he, he realized that if he does another movie like that, a lot of people were like, we want another one like that. But if he does mm. that, he's going to sort of get stuck doing those kind of movies and he can't do other stuff. But then he was like, oh, if I do something radically different, then it's going to alienate a lot of these fans I have now. So there's a period of about, probably about almost 10 years after Pulp Fiction where he doesn't really make a proper movie. He does a lot of stuff where he like, like he'll co-write and co-direct movies with different people, but he mm-hmm. doesn't really make a proper movie, not until Kill Bill. Kill Bill was sort of oh, yeah. his return as like his full-fledged 100% Quentin Tarantino movie again. And okay. that's why I went and I saw um, Jackie Brown because after Pulp Fiction, he made Jackie Brown like three years later. And God, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of like the anti-Pulp Fiction, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's like it takes all the talking head stuff of Pulp Fiction, but it's like, it's like it removes all the gore, removes all the violence, and it's like if you ever want to know what what would a Quentin Tarantino movie be without all the gore and without all the violence, it'd be Jackie Brand. It's so boring, and I think um, I think he must have based off the fact that it came three years after Pulp Fiction, he must have jumped pretty much right into making that, and I think also that was a reaction to a lot of the criticisms of Pulp Fiction. Uh, a lot of people didn't like the gore, so I think he was trying to correct it in that, and that sort of steered his career into this <laughs> underground for a while <laughs> until he emerged again with Kill Bill and made all the glorious movies that we know. But, um, yeah, it's interesting to sort of track his career. And overall, I think he's a fantastic guy. He's at a point of his career now where he does seem to be repeating some of his themes, like Hateful Eight is basically Reservoir Dogs, but inverted. Where in, in the setting Dogs, of Django, Django, what's... Like it's, it, it, uh, as in like Hateful Eight is it, is in the Old West and it's got uh, and it's about slavery and stuff like that. It's it's, a, mm. it's Reservoir Dogs oh, with yeah. like the Django Unchained backdrop. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and like you know, Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs are very similar and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, he's at the point now where he's starting to repeat some of his themes. But um, 
who cares? They're still great movies. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I think I've talked long when enough. you talk <laughs> about repeating themes, I think certain directors are really good at doing that without people, you know, not necessarily catching on without people getting sick of it. Like someone like Christopher mm. Nolan can tell a story that's, you know, always grandiose and thematic and sometimes out of, and oftentimes very much so out of order and, and, and people don't get too upset about it. I think like Interstellar was like the first time people were just like, I don't know, man, Christopher Nolan may not be the best director, even though I still love that movie unabashedly. Um, so when you say something like Tarantino, Hateful Eight is essentially Reservoir Dogs in the sense that yeah, in the sense that it's all set they're in one in location. Room. They're trying yeah, to and figure just, out who someone is. Yeah, but they're just talking, and 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 you're just seeing conversations. But I think the difference is is that I didn't feel as much tension in Reservoir Dogs as I did in The Hateful Eight. Like, when The Hateful Eight starts, and you're just, you know, after you get through the 40 minutes in the snow and you get to the actual haberdashery, um, for the, be, be, right before the, before the, the, you know, the cut, whenever we get to the narration, the whole buildup is just this tense conversation where everything is kind of built on top of the next. But with Reservoir Dogs, it's just a bunch of guys having conversations. And granted, there is a switch when people, you know, when, when things do actually start happening and people end up getting, and more more than one person ends up actually getting shot and um, and more things start, start getting revealed, you know. Um, but for a long time, it's just guys having conversations. And I think the opening is the opening scene where they're at the diner. I think that might be the, I think, I forget that's the opening scene, but that it's one of the earlier scenes where in the, they're in the diner talking about tipping. Um, and it seems like that. It's yeah, a great and scene. they're talking about Madonna song, just like a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you hear that Madonna actually like responded to him at one point? Really? Did she? What did yeah, she say? Yeah. Uh, she, um, the, the two ended up meeting and she gave him like a signed copy of, of the Like a Virgin CD and on the inside it said no, no Quinton, it's about love <laughs> <laughs> something like that should, that should we describe that, what that conversation in that scene is like for people who don't want to <laughs> who don't know <laughs> how do we do the family friendly version um <laughs> I'm honestly forgetting what you guys are talking about. I'm honest with you. I saw the movie like two days ago, and I have no idea you guys were on about. I'm like, what Madonna song? Not good. You remember we- <laughs> the guys? The guy he's saying like Madonna's song like is just like a virgin, mm-hmm. and uh, he's saying that the song it sounds like it's on the surface. You think, oh, it's just about love, but it's really about how she was dating this uh, rather large black man. Let's oh, let's just say yeah. that's right. so much so that. Um, when they uh, have their special time together, it hurts the same way as it did the first time, hence, like a virgin. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> so when you were telling like, that story, because, me, I, was oh, like, I was like, I wonder if she's going to be like, is his theory right? Is that what that song's really about? Because <laughs> you get those quirky openings and these dialogue-driven sequences that are like, they're often in, in films nowadays, particularly in student and, and indie films. But in the early 90s with Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs, th- that wasn't around. That wasn't common. And Tarantino, I think, is one of of the most influential filmmakers of our generation, I think. Like whether or not he's the best or worst, like it's up to you. But I think he's one of the most influential, definitely in regards to like the new wave of filmmakers. Oh yeah, he's he's one of the modern classic filmmakers, and I think I put that in the Facebook page. You know, when people if if, if you were to say make a Mount Rushmore of the best filmmakers in the last twenty years, you know Tarantino's on that on that route, Mount Rushmore. I would personally put Nolan on there too, but Tarantino's definitely oh, yeah. up it, there. It, if it's the last twenty years, yeah, I'd say put Nolan on that too. Yeah, it's Tarantino, Nolan, and I can't remember the other two. Edgar uh, Wright. Edgar, uh, probably. I don't know. He's made some great movies. Um, but going back to Tarantino, you know, the movie opens up, Reservoir Dogs opens up with the scene where they're talking about tipping, and they make a great point about how, you know, people are saying how it's rude. It's always rude not to tip people, and Steve Buscemi is like, I don't believe in it. And then he starts talking about how, you know, people are like, you know, they work for tips at this restaurant. It's like, yeah, but they do that for McDonald's too, but you don't tip at McDonald's, do you? And I said to myself, <laughs> that's a great point. And so next time, next time I go to McDonald's, I'm probably going to tip the people working there. I'm like, can you keep, can you keep tips because of that scene from Reservoir Dogs? <laughs> is there um, but over, in Britain, yeah. Trilby? Because there's no tipping here in Australia. Um, there is tipping. Uh, if you go to, uh, it's, of course, uh, you don't have to do it, but there are some places in London where they put the tip on your bill, and I think that is outrageous. I will tip if I yeah. want to, and if I think you've done a good enough job. How, I, I, how does it work, though? Like, what's the protocol for that? Like, how do you even know okay. how much to leave? Uh, as someone, the, the, as someone the who's standard only started... Is, is you tip 10 to 11%. 
Okay. That's that's just like the unwritten rule. Like, so it, say your meal comes to twenty eight pounds or twenty eight dollars, you tip like maybe like $2 three, or... three, yeah, well, three dollars, yeah, like the um, yeah, around that area, yeah, you, you tip like t- uh, typically ten to eleven percent. Hmm. But so so tipping that's to subsidize the minimum wage. Yes, essentially, yeah. because they often get paid minimum wage, so they need more than minimum wage to survive. Hence, what, the tips. what is minimum wage in America? Seven fifty. I, listen, I haven't. Wow, um, that is really it's, low. Um, yeah. It's like it's it's like six seventy in the UK. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Six pound seventy, which is wow. like eight or nine dollars. I think here in Australia, well, think... here in Australia, the minimum wage I think is thirteen an hour, which is probably why we don't have tipping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't need to. Or because if you ask an Australian man to tip somebody, he's going to throw a boomerang at your face and then have his pet kangaroo bite you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I had to. <laughs> What'd you but, say, um, mate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. The, the UK minimum wage is like just under nine dollars, which is um, uh, yeah, it's. I don't know if that's Listen, reasonable or not. It might be higher. Than, it might be like it might be like eight bucks. But I'm I'm I was told that minimum wage is like seven fifty around that area, something like that. But then again, I haven't had a job yet. I applied and then they didn't accept my application. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so, <laughs> do you guys, Toby, what do you think of you? Tar talk Tarantino. Go ahead. Um, uh, Tarantino in general, or shall we move on to films? Uh, let's move on to films while we're at it. Well, well, since we're on Reservoir Dogs, it's it's oh, where yeah. it all started, and I think because um, it's it is one of the like uh, most influential independent films ever. Like it's it's made on a shoestring budget. You can tell it's set in one location, and I didn't watch this uh, for the first time until a few months ago, actually. Because um, when uh, me and my girlfriend moved to the moved to our flat, and it was um, we were promised a furnished flat, but we turned up and the place was barren, um, and we set up um, the TV which we brought with us um, and we watched uh, Reservoir Dogs for the first time and we could relate to the people in Reservoir Dogs you know turning up um, at a location it doesn't quite go to plan you're in this barren location and you just want to kill each other because it's so stressful um, so basically that's that's. Um, I don't think one of you first... showed up with their being shot though I don't think like one of you um, rolled up with the bullet in your belly no, that, that that didn't happen, but um, it, it was pretty close to a real live Reservoir Dog situation. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it was, it's weird watching the Hateful Eight first and then watching Reservoir Dogs. Like, yeah. I think Reservoir Dogs is is his first movie, but it's the last one I've seen. <laughs> uh, so it's weird, um, like reverse engineering um, his filmography like that. But you see, like, um, just his propensity for dialogue and just um, his weird. Um, but somehow organic cuts his editing is is um, is actually really on point in this film, and um, and of course the, yeah. the the reliance on on hardly any music but um actual, licensed uh, music which so few of his films actually have a composer he just plays his favorite music yeah which, which is an interesting touch. Eight, I think that's why the hateful eight works so well as well when you think about it because the hateful eight has that score by who is it? it's Anicio Marcon or something like that something like I can't pronounce the name properly probably but uh, that um, old famous composer yes. um, yeah, Ennio Morricone Ennio Morricone there you go I, it was, I said it how it was spelled but not how it's pronounced <laughs> um, and so yeah go ahead Banda I was just going to say for his music I guess um I guess the fact that he's just playing the music he likes probably feeds into sort of a trademark of Tarantino, which is like he'll play the music, play the music, play the music, but then when it jumps to have done the scene, it just cuts. The music just stops. You know, yes. that happens a lot in a lot of his movies. <laughs> Maybe it's not so much a stylistic choice, whereas he's like, how am I going to transition this music out? Oh, I'll just cut it. And now it's kind of become his <laughs> style. <laughs> yeah. It's great now, if you could, you could weave in like shortcuts in filmmaking as a style. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's that's always a very good. But I think there's something that happens in Reservoir Dogs that happens in all of Quentin Tarantino's movies. But I feel like whenever it happens in Reservoir Dogs, I was I was very very uncomfortable, and that was every time they use the N word. And so, and I think like I think that helps with the because when the character is it's, the wrong <laughs> director for you if you don't like. The and, I'm, and I'm and I'm no, if I, and I'm getting to the point like when it happens to something like Django or The yeah. Hateful Eight. I'm completely cool with it. I don't know why, because I guess it's I guess it's set in that time, so people would just still use yeah. that word in that way. But like the fact that this is set in like ninety three, whenever the movie's set like ninety two, and it's about 
a bunch of white guys who are crooks that I'm supposed to be, you know, quote unquote rooting for. And then they all start spewing the N word. I didn't feel a lot of sympathy when they all started getting, you know, chopped or <laughs> killed away. I was like, good for Michael Madsen getting shot by a, um, I think, I'm not sure. What was I, what was I going for? But yeah, that, that, that was not, that wasn't fun. Every time they had to drop that line, like you're talking like an N word. I'm like, ah, you don't need to, you know, that, that's not necessary, but yeah, whatever. It, it is like him trying to be edgy, independent 1990s filmmaker, which it, it, it was edgy at the time, but now it's kind of aged badly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think at the time, like when he, when he made it, he was the new kid on the block. So, yeah. you know, if you're the new kid on the block, you've got to make a lot of noise, otherwise people don't pay attention to you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was probably it's part of that in as well. It's age to, to make a name on the block than offend some black people. That's absolutely... <laughs> well, um, this that film... and gore, that's what made people pay attention to him. <laughs> well, if you look at today's society, black people and gore go very well with together. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I had to. I well, had um... to. Let's pull this up. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Reservoir Dogs did make a splash when it was um, it was debuted at the Sundance Film Festival, and it, the very first screening of the movie went horribly wrong because they were put in the film was screened in a really old um, movie uh, movie s- screen, and it was not a wide screen. Um, screening it was it, like for some reason uh, the projector would not do widescreen so like half of the screen for Reservoir Dogs was just completely cut out and Tarantino filmed it in such a way to utilize the widescreen so like 10-15 minutes into the film he just stood up yelled at everyone in the screening and said stop the movie I did not this is my very first movie my very first screening I do not want it to be shown like this so they screened it again in a different place and then they they changed that movie theater to um they changed the projector and the screen to accommodate widescreen viewing so what, that's what what way, 1990s what, what 1990s theater is still screening a 4 by 3 movie mm. i don't that i don't know exactly well, that, that nostalgia for the old fashioned filmmaking uh, comes full circle with death proof which oh, when, nice segue. which I'll, I'll no I'll wait for you to finish your point that I'll talk about death no, no, that proof. that was the point <laughs> Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's he's mad for he's mad for the film. He doesn't want to film digitally for some reason. You know, I don't I don't entirely get that. I'd be like, just maybe it was digital. a maybe it was a digital four by three projector. So he just has like a grudge against film projector, like digital projector. He's like, no, a digital projector almost ruined my career. Mm. I don't know. It, it killed my family. <laughs> well, the yeah, the it, killed yeah. it killed Martha. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you project in that aspect ratio? <laughs> four by three. It has to be widescreen. Why'd you say that aspect ratio? <laughs> Why did you say four by three? <laughs> what does he mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> oh god. But um. But yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> but so Death a Bruce. Tarantino yeah. movie yeah. that I'll, kind of flew under the radar for a lot of people. I'd never seen un- until this. Uh, came out in 2007, it's called Death yeah. Proof, and uh, it has Kurt Russell in it, so I guess that's where he and Tarantino first worked together, and then, you know, of course, Kurt Russell was then in Hateful Eight, did a really great job in Hateful Eight too, yes. but the, what's strange about this one, of the, <laughs> this Tarantino movie, 2007, it's clearly, this is a movie that he clearly made just because he enjoyed those kind of movies, and you can see it, and you kind of get into the spirit of it, like... Talking like again about his nostalgia for the old, old films. This is one where he's actually gone out of his way, where he'll include, which I'm sure is not real. I'm sure it's a digital thing he put in, where it looks like there's grain on the film as it's going through, like an old 1960s movie. And um, there's even bits where there'll be, um, uh, so like the audio will kind of like drop out of one speaker, and you're like. Did he put that in on purpose, or is this a bad recording, or what? Mm. So, yeah, and there's, like, grit and stuff on the film. So, but you could see there's that love there that Tarantino made it. He's like, yeah, I want to make this, like, a movie from the 1960s. And mm. i got to tell you, like, I meant to go look up on Google. I thought, he was working through some issues when he made Death Proof. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go and find like oh maybe he just got divorced from his wife or something because he was working through some issues I think. But is he married? Pro- I don't know. I don't even know. I, I never. <laughs> I never went and googled it. But <laughs> I meant I like to, and then to I forgot about woman. it. But I feel like that's why he thinks he can get away from things. He's married to a black woman. But whatever. That's neither here. Nor there. <laughs> he's married maybe. to his job. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but um, Death Proof is about. Um, 
Kurt Russell is a stuntman called Stuntman Mike, and he's got a car that is one of those stunt cars which is death proof. You can crash it, and you're almost certain that you won't die. That's why it's called death proof. Uh, and he uses this car to murder people. <laughs> Like killing them with like a head-on collision and then he can be like, oh, it was just an accident oh, and then he can go do it again. And um, it's such a strange, strange movie because it's like, it's like the movie is basically a carload of girls, right? Um, they're talking, 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 booty shot, talking, 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 booty shot, talking, 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 foot fetish shot. He loves his foot fetish. Like this and, yum, and yum. Jackie Brown, There's, it's really visible watching one after the other, his, his foot fetish thing going on. There's a lot of shots of like um, uh, girls like as they're driving around and like girls were like, uh, one girl in particular must have loved those feet. <laughs> she's like got her, <laughs> got her feet crossed and sort of out the car window as she's like singing and the feet are kind of moving as she's singing. And she's got like rings like on her toes, like toe rings. <laughs> like I don't know what they are. That seems very impractical. Yeah, rings. like jewellery <laughs> on her foot. And I'm like, settle down there, Tiger. Okay. <laughs> he even has a scene where like Kurt Russell, he, he walks past and make he's that, like... Make sees... that a shirt, settle down there, Tiger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like Kurt Russell, like he walks past, he sees the foot and he kind of like goes and he's sort of like licks the foot (laughs) and the girl's like oh what was that (laughs) that's like settle down tiger so yeah i think he was working through some issues there but it's like yeah it's kind of like they it's it has the the tarantino thing of following this group of girls in this case uh this group of people and they're talking about just stuff and the conversations aren't as interesting as some of his other ones, but they break it up with, like, the booty shots and a lap dance here. Kurt Russell gets a lap dance, and so that keeps you interested. Then Kurt Russell does his first vehicular murder, and, my God, it is glorious. It is so <laughs> good. It's, it's a moment where, like, watch this movie just for the vehicle stuff alone because – he has a head-on collision with these girls. They're all in the car. They've got the radio up. And they're all singing. Head-on collision. And Quentin Tarantino, he replays the crash four times in a row in slow motion so you can watch what happens to each one of the girls in the car. And it's <laughs> gloriously <laughs> violent. Like one girl, like her leg is kind of out the window doing the foot thing. So like when the cars hit together... Like she flies forward and her leg just slices off, and her leg just like her leg just like slaps on the ground like a fish, just goes. <laughs> <laughs> Another chick like like the the like uh, Kurt Russell's car like takes the roof off the car, and like in slow motion the tire like drives over her face and like goes and like just peels her face off. It's glorious. <laughs> it's really amazing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then we go back to then we then it sort of does the horror movie thing where it goes to a new group of girls and it's all boring talking booty shot here boring talking upskirt shot here whatever and then it climaxes like at this point in the movie i was That's like uh, i could kind of go 50 50 with it but then it climaxes with one of the greatest mad max style car chases i think i've ever seen it was so mm-hmm. So awesome. These two cars, because, like, Kurt Russell's got his muscle car and this other group of girls, they got their muscle car. And it's amazing. And it's like this chase sort of thing where he's chasing them, then they're chasing him, and it goes back and forth, and they're going through country roads, and they're missing cows, and they're spinning out, and then they go on the highway, and it's amazing. It's really, really it's not, cool. Is that the one where the girl flips on, is, like, is like tied to the, the hood of the car yeah, I've, I've, seen, girls, I've seen clips about the that, girls yeah. they want to they want to get this muscle car because she like um she's doing i don't know they have a name for it where she's like out on the bonnet of the car as they're driving really fast and she's got like mm. uh they got like belts like through the doors on either side so she's sort of like laying on her back on the bonnet of the car with her arms out at the sides holding onto these mm. straps as they're like racing through and then kurt russell comes up and starts like ramming them and she's like Whoa! and it's really awesome but <laughs> i was like that ed that ed chasey like at that point i was like i could go either way with it but that ed chasey totally redeems the whole movie so if you want to see for our listeners if you want to see a quentin tarantino movie where it's obvious that quentin tarantino doesn't really care about whether this succeeds or not he just wants to make a movie Movie that he really enjoys, where you, it gives you a window into all these creepy fetishes, <laughs> and with some amazingly awesome car stuff. Death Proof 
is really really cool i highly recommend it <laughs> well um right. well, death proof is is part of the um the grindhouse double feature movie that he did with, with uh, robert rodriguez that's right so yeah. Um, so uh, yeah and it's got like edgar wright did a horror movie trailer with um like will arnett did the voiceover and it's got si- uh, simon Pegg and nick frost and um um they did hobo with the, the hobo with a shotgun and machete uh fake trailers and machete actually got yeah. its own movie and i think so hobo did with hobo, shotgun so did did as well it. It did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and like I think Rob Zombie did like a, like werewolf women who are also Nazis and it's something like that. <laughs> like it, it, I recommend watching the whole like three hour thing if it sounds like something you'd be into. Like um, um, Planet Terror is not bad either. It's got Rose McGowan as like um, um an, an exotic dancer who has a prosthetic leg that is also a gun. Um, so if, if that right. sounds like if, if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, uh, don't just watch Death Proof. Watch all of um of Grindhouse. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. I I don't, I don't have much else to add to that because I've never. How do you follow the I've, prosthetic like that is also a gun? Well, well, it's also in the Lone <laughs> Ranger, but um, um, but I can, but I can oh, say yeah. that you know, as someone who's never seen uh, neither the Grindhouse uh, cut, if you will, or Death Proof itself, uh, it's a film that I'm probably going to put my homework for. I might check it out in, in time for next week's episode. Mm. It well, sounds. I think we need to... We need to take a quick break because you just like shocked the audience by reminding them that the Lone Ranger movie existed. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a thing three years ago, people. No, you did not. You, you are not the only ones who forgot. <laughs> oh, the audience kind of had to like sit there. It's like it's like a Jon Snow style twist around. Just starts like freaking out on the trying to listen to the show. Some guy just crashed his car because he. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it's a death proof car. <laughs> to All be right. fair there is a really awesome action scene in the lone ranger but apart from that uh, no nope, is it the bit with the train and like all the bottles and those shooting the bottles and theme songs playing that's the one part i very remember um it, it's, well, it's, it's like the last half hour of the film yeah basically yeah it's too bad yeah. that the first two hours of that two and a half hour film is trash um okay oh God, so long yeah but that but <laughs> Back to Tarantino. Uh, what else, do you want- else is long? Hateful Eight, Django Unchained. Because um, <laughs> uh, as much as I love um, Tarantino's movies, um, his, his editor, I forget her name, Sally something, I'm going to quickly look it up, uh, passed away after editing uh, Inglorious Bastards. And, oh, okay. um, and um, Sally Menk, yeah, she passed away in 2010, so she didn't edit uh, Hateful Eight and uh, Django Unchained. And I think Sally Menk, you... You can tell that um, her influence has gone from the films because she was nominated for like best um, Academy Award for Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill and Inglorious Bastards. I, no, not not Kill Bill, but she got a lot of awards for that. Um, so, and then once she passed away, um, Tarantino basically said, "I'm going to make three hour films and damn the consequences." Uh, and um, I think that's why I think Inglorious Bastards is um, what is um, better than Django Unchained and Hateful Eight. And Bastards is actually my favorite movie of his, although it may be because it's the first one of his that I saw. So I maybe have that natural affection for it. See, I was going I to say that Django is be best too. I was going to say that Django is my favorite. I was going to say Django is my favorite because Django is the one that I saw first. I was like thirteen when I first when I saw Django and Jane. I was so happy. I'm like, what is this crazy violent world that you call Tarantino? And I just went back and watched the rest of his stuff, except apparently Bill and Jackie Brown. But um, uh, but uh, I guess we can we can go to Glorious Bastards. You guys want to talk about Glorious Bastards? Since you guys love it so much, we can we can go into that one. Let's let's take a look into those films. Deadly. Um. Oh, yeah, this is sorry, the movie that introduced. Uh, uh, um, it was a bit fritzy for a moment. Uh, the Skype, but um, yeah, yeah, this is sorry, the movie that introduced I was, us. I was trying to Google whether <laughs> whether he got divorced around Death Proof or something, but <laughs> <You're> really <laughs> curious about that, aren't you? Wow, <laughs> divorce is re- this tears everything apart. Families <laughs> podcast. I'm it's telling you, he was going apart. through some issues when he made that. <laughs> I can look it up myself yeah. if you want. Man. It's way anyway. too much booty and foot stuff for him not to be going through issues. <laughs> anyway, you can, booty thank, and foot stuff. <laughs> you can thank Inglorious Bastards for introducing the world to Christoph Waltz and to a, a lesser yes. extent, Michael Fassbender. Oh, yeah. Because Michael true, Fassbender, yeah. he, he was in 300. He, done, he did Hunger. He has the best uh, he, line in that movie. He has the, mm, the we will fight in the shade. I love that line. Yeah. yeah. 
But he he was kind of around, but Inglorious Bastards was when he truly arrived on the scene, and then when then he's killing Nazis in X Men First Class. You can kind of see why he got the role of Magneto. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Christoph Waltz, that opening scene, so mm. good. Like, that may be the mo- like the defining moment of Tarantino's career in terms of just how well it's directed and written. And um, Tarantino was at um, he was at a film festival this past year. Can't remember uh, this past week, sorry. Um, and basically saying, "Hey, um, I'm not maybe I won't retire after my tenth film." Because he said that like a few months ago that he may retire after his tenth film. He was basically backtracking. But he said in the interview that he thinks that um, Hans Lander in in Inglorious Bastards is, um, in his opinion, the best character he's ever created. Mm. Um, and mm. I'm I, that's a bingo. I'm, I'm, Sorry, that, that's <laughs> very good. And that's I think, a bingo. I think, I think he's right. Is that I how think you say it? That's a bingo. <laughs> you just uh, say we bingo. just say bingo. <laughs> bingo. How fun! <laughs> it's, it's oh, I love that um, guy. Also, he's my favorite Nazi. He really is. I, <laughs> you can't help but like the guy, even though he's absolutely horrendous. <laughs> you, yeah. you even after he strangles that chick, you're still kind of like. But he's so charismatic. <laughs> he, he's the great. He's a great villain in that you love to hate him. Yeah, and th- that's that's the best villain. Um, Daniel Brühl also like he 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 broke out in this film as well. Daniel Brühl's great actor as well. Um, yeah. uh, Zemo Zemo from yeah. Civil War or uh, the guy from Rush because no one's seen Rush. Even though you all should go see I love Rush. Rush. Great. It's great. Everyone he should go see Rush. <laughs> he should have won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar. He didn't even get nominated. Uh, Christoph Waltz was 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 also in that year for uh, what to book, but it should have went to Leonardo DiCaprio that year for Bloody Django Unchained. But yes, whatever. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll get to Django soon, but uh, yeah. I do think DiCaprio that if he was going to win an Oscar, rather that than The Revenant, any day of the week, oh, absolutely, absolutely, man. <laughs> we'll be in the parlor room having hot cake. Yes, but you know, um... <laughs> I forgot that line. <laughs> and then you just came flooding back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, I think go ahead. Um, I remember um, going back to like Christoph Waltz, uh, Tarantino. He was talking about when he and Christoph Waltz, like sort of a characterization for uh, Hans Lander there was in that opening scene where he's talking to the farmer guy. And he's like, do you mind if I smoke my pipe as well? And they smoke Mm -hmm. their pipes. Throughout the rest of the movie, he he doesn't smoke a pipe. He smokes cigarettes. And apparently Christoph Waltz was like, doesn't he smoke a pipe? Why why does he switch to cigarettes? And um, Quentin Tarantino is like, no, no, he smokes cigarettes. He smoked a pipe because he knew that that farmer smoked a pipe. That's why he picked a pipe because he's trying to... You know, it's part of his way of like, I know you, I'm, and also it's like a Sherlock Holmes kind of pipe, like yeah, I'm he a brings detective out a sort of thing. Pipe, so like, like, even, like the farmer's just got a small pipe, and he just brings out this massive face size like, Gandalf esque yeah. pipe. It's like it's like mine's bigger than yours, that kind of thing as well. <laughs> yeah, but it's like yeah. that's how that's how well defined his characters are. Even a little thing that you don't even notice like that, there's a reason for it, and there's like. Hans Lander, like, even that is a game. Everything's a game with him. <laughs> but what yeah. I like about that movie as well is how it subverts expectations because from that yes. towards the end, you're expecting that um, Shushana is going to get revenge and take out the Juhana. Nope. Nope. It doesn't yeah. happen. You, and they really... <laughs> and, like, when, and, like, when... It's crazy how there's, there's the point when you realise... Because I, I, I guess Tarantino always does this in his films, where a character dies and you have that sense of, no, not them, you know, like, uh, like you yeah. know, I, I felt that way about Kurt Russell in uh, Hateful Eight, uh, you know, Christoph Waltz in Django, and then in this movie, it's when the moment Daniel Bruhl uh, enter, I forgot the the character's name in the in the movie, but the moment he enters the room, uh, enters the the film room, well, up up there in the theater. Uh, is it Soshana you said that her name was? The moment that he yeah. enters the room with her, I was like, oh, she's not getting out if you're alive. Frederick and, Zola. And it's, That's his yeah, name. Zola, Zola. Zola. Yeah, Zola. Yeah. yeah, the moment he goes in there, I'm like, oh, she's not getting out there alive. And and then when... Um, she shoots the, him in the, the back, yeah. Yeah, and then the actress gets taken out by by Hans. I was like, oh, no, it, it's... Yeah, the way they... It's all going sorry. wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's like everything's falling apart. And then... Um, yeah, is it- I couldn't believe it when she got shot because I'm like... I was... I knew... I'm like, she's going to get revenge on Hans Lander. Mm. And they even set it up with that bit where, you know, he's talking to her in the restaurant uh, when she's there and he has that moment where he's like, there was something else I was going to ask you. 
It's like she freezes, and then he's like, but I can't remember it right now. And he puts his cigarette out. <laughs> <laughs> he's just yeah. like, not now. <laughs> so they like, set up like, for it, and then yeah. she rolls the guy over, and he just goes, bang, bang, bang. And you're like, whoa. Yeah. Well, hey, mm, that's life. She, not everyone gets revenge, I guess. <laughs> and in the and in the background, they're playing that um, um, Nazi propaganda, which um, bears a striking similarity to uh, to American Sniper. But uh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I was, um, was going to say that feel that's a very cinematic film. That if you take away the whole Nazi thing, I'm like, that's not a bad movie. You know, it's yeah. a pretty cool story <laughs> about one guy that took out forty. Then, yeah, I'm like, but then he realizes the Nazi. Like, oh, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm amazed that um, uh, Melanie Lorraine, who plays uh, Shosh- uh, Shoshana, um, she's in- I. Now you see me. Sorry, go ahead, Chili. Yeah, she is. I'm. I'm amazed she didn't break out more in more in the West. Like she, she does a lot of French films. Um, she actually played Disgust in Inside Out in the French dub of the film. Um, but I'm amazed that uh, that she didn't break out more after after appearing in a Tarantino film because Tarantino tends to resurrect careers like John Travolta. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah he sure <laughs> resurrected his career. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, it wasn't Tarantino's fault with what happened to John Travolta after Pulp Fiction. Right? That was John Travolta's fault. Okay. That yeah. was Battlefield Earth's problem. Speaking of resurrecting careers, Mike Myers is randomly an inglorious yeah, bastard. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's down so great. With Hitler, all the way down, sir. <laughs> well, now we've got all our eggs in one basket. Now it's time to blow up the basket. Can Can Mike Myers make movies again, please? I don't know about you guys. He, that was he's I, got I, one like, coming up. Does he? He's Does got, he? Is it a comedy? I'm, I'm, I want to go see it. I'll check it out. Look, it's, it's called Terminal. Um, let me just look it up. Uh, you keep talking. I'll find out this film. I think it's like... Got, Please don't um, be about cancer. Please don't be about cancer. Oh, no. it, okay, it's, it's got, uh, it's got Margot it, Robbie it. and Simon Pegg in it. It's a noir oh, thriller. Oh, man. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. That's all you need to say. Wow. Simon Pegg in a noir thriller? All right. All right. I'm in. I got you. All it's right. directed by there. Vaughn Stein. Um, and <laughs> What did he do? I don't know. I'm finding out. Um, right. It's ri- it's from the um, screenwriter of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two, All right. and it's yeah. from Steve Close. Steve Close. Um, I think so. All right. Uh, I think I think it's um, a first time director actually. Oh, okay. So I, I'm excited then. Actually, hmm. nah. That's hey. Yeah, hey. yeah he, he worked day. on. Well, he, yeah, he worked on the second unit for World War Z, Snow White and the Huntsman, Danish Girl. He's done a lot of second unit stuff. So clearly, okay. experience. Well, time. By the time he got himself I'm, his own movie. Anyways, I'm back right. to Django. Or not Django, back to Inglourious Bastards. Yeah, um, yeah I, I definitely think that's that's Quentin Tarantino's best work. It sort of takes all the different things that he's known for and like combines them all. Like It's got the Pulp Fiction thing of there's its movie starts out and there's separate story threads and they all slowly intertwine as the movie goes <laughs> on. It's got that. It's got the gore. <laughs> it's got great, great characters. Great performances. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. got one of the best scenes in a bar ever. It's like it's yes. like Raiders oh, and Inglorious Bastards great. for tent scenes in bars because like you have the, uh, the where he puts up these like the American version or whatever of the or the English version of three. You're like, oh man, it's that small detail. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think it also has one of the best endings to any movie, any movie yes. ever. I yeah. love the so, way uh, it movie ends. Are, yeah, are we both essentially saying that Inglorious Bastards might just be Tarantino's masterpiece? Oh, definitely. <laughs> oh, no, I get it now. He just got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know how you get to Carnegie Hall, right? <laughs> Practice. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Arrivederci. <laughs> Arrivederci. It's weird I didn't get that because I've seen that movie so many times in Glorious yeah, Bastards. Um, I love the way I, it ends. I, I do, so, yeah, absolutely. They, they uh, actually, uh, oh. in the same, the same guy who gets shot in the balls in that bar <laughs> scene, remember that yeah. guy? Say, a Vita's anti Nazi balls and he shoots him in the balls. That guy, when they're showing the montage of all the different people that, that what's his name? Remember the guy who's like sharpening his knife and he's like, don't I look calm to you? What was that character's name? I cannot tell you for the life of me. Um, Stiglitz. Stiglitz, that's it. Hugo Stiglitz. Yeah, when they're showing the the montage of all the guys that he's killed, all the Nazi officers, he strangles one Nazi officer and they reuse the same actor. It's the same actor who gets shot in the balls. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. So I was like, hey, you killed that guy twice. The Nazis might have had clones, man. Nazis got clones. Yeah, or he had a twin brother or something. (laughs) Yeah, twin brother. There you go. There you go. Twin brother. Maybe that guy's had a really unlucky unlucky war. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, right. You just got out of the hospital. You you survived your strangulation, but now your balls are toast. Not only does your larynx no longer work, you now have no fun- non functioning testicles. Uh, yeah, there's a bit where Brad uh, Pitt pushes the bullet through the woman's leg. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He puts his finger in the bullet wound. Yeah, yeah. And when he takes uh, his finger out, it actually goes. <laughs> it makes this kind of popping sound. Oh god. <laughs> That is a good movie, yeah. though. I'm going to have to rewatch it to see how it stacks up against the rest of them, because I've seen Django countless times. I've seen The Hateful Eight a few times. I've only seen Glorious Bastards once. So I'm going to go back and rewatch it and see how it, uh, how it holds up. Uh, from, and I've seen, it's been a few months since I've seen it. I just keep on thinking about the bastards doing their Italian impression. Like, Gorlami. <laughs> Gorlami. <laughs> once more, I want to hear the fire in your voice. <laughs> Like he doesn't believe it for a second, but he plays along just to make his victory more sweet. And it's yeah. just oh, that's yeah. it is a great, it, it's a career defining performance. And I love the bit where uh, where they're like, "Oh, don't worry, nobody speaks Italian anyway." And then they go to Hans Lander and he just starts babbling away in like perfect Italian, and all their faces just drop. <laughs> the best like, part is that like the guy who the guy who sold to say the least knows the best Italian, like clearly has the best Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He speaks the best. best to be the main Dominic guy. Coco. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Uh, yeah, but th- th- that's my favorite Tarantino film, and I-, I think it's not just because it's the first one I saw. I do think it genuinely holds up. Well, I'm gonna have <laughs> yeah. to go back and rewatch it. Uh, I'm excited because I you have I to watch know, Kill just, Bill too. I do movies. have to watch mm-hmm. Kill Bill. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a busy. Remember movie that was his comeback after his his dark period after uh, Pulp Fiction. <laughs> uh, Jackie Brown after his possible no. divorce. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> After his still up in the air split with his wife <laughs> that he may or may not have. <laughs> oh, in other news, I looked it up on Wikipedia and apparently he's not married and did not have a divorce bandit. So, uh, uh, yeah, theory disclosed. Your your really? strange Tarantino any, any conspiracy. Any stories about him having like a relationship breakup in two thousand seven or? Man, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go Google a man's entire oh, life. You, you know how um, <laughs> sounds like a like, real quitter's attitude. <laughs> You know how like historians like somebody often needs to go think, back to bed, bandit. <laughs> you know how historians often think like what what did Shakespeare do during those ten years where he's just not in any history books or not writing anything? What did he do during that time? Do you think Tarantino's like that? What did he do during that dark period? Did he go on an adventure? Did he fight Nazis? Did he get a divorce? Someone needs to make that movie. <laughs> Tarantino's dark period. It's like the lost years of Jesus, you know. What oh, did he no. do? And, it be- <laughs> and it becomes like a black uh, black exploitation film, but it's clearly a white guy in the lead. Yeah, I can imagine <laughs> Jesus walking along with all the Tarantino music playing. <laughs> Crucify this. Stuck in the middle with you, it's him on the <laughs> Don't give him ideas; he'll probably make. No, it. he'll definitely he'll definitely do it. It'll be like Kevin Smith's idea for nine eleven. Oh yeah. man. Oh my goodness! Like he watches Passion also, of the Christ, he's like, "Hey, I can do it better." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, "I like the gore, but you know, need more." He's like, "There's to too much, feet. too many snakes, more nails, more nails. Come on, not enough, too much snakes." <laughs> oh, my oh, what a crap film! Anyways, um, not <laughs> don't yeah. offend anybody by saying that. Yeah, I don't like yeah. anybody. That's just me. It's my opinion. Okay, um, do you guys want to go to Django? Because we've talked about Django before. Um, but since yeah. we're talking about Tarantino, I guess Chobi, I don't think it, I don't think have you ever talked about Django with us on the podcast? I uh, can't remember. I I can't recall. But Django so, uh, would it would it would be a ten out of ten film if it was twenty minutes shorter. <laughs> you didn't like the bloodbath at the end? Literally. No, no, I like the bloodbath at the end. It just <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I liked the ending, but it just it was twenty minutes too long. It's the same reason why I can't completely gush over the hateful eight. It just does feel like you could lose twenty to thirty minutes, and that's why I do think that um, he does need an editor. Now, but with the I hateful still- eight, I can say that you can cut out a big portion of the snow stuff, like even like. Granted, he wants to show off the scenery and the score, but you can cut out a good twenty minutes of the snow stuff in hateful eight. Mm-hmm. What in Django would you cut uh, to make the I, film 20 minutes shorter? I think, 
I think it's just like literally trimming maybe a minute or two from certain scenes. Just it's it's not wiping out entire segments. It is just tightening up and trimming, just stuff like that, just to make it a bit snappier. But I don't get me wrong, I still do love Django Unchained. I do think that um, Jamie Fox is just superb in the lead. I think he should have been nominated for best lead actor the year this came out because he he is so restrained and he's like a coiled spring, just ready to just just go at any moment and when. When he finally is let off his leash, so to speak, when he is finally oh, unchained, the <laughs> when they're, taking, that, when they're against... taking the the brothers down. Oh man, that yes. is such a such a great bit of um, like he's like he's finally with the gun and Jamie and or Jango gets the whip. Oh man, yes. and then of course at the bit at the end where he shoots the guy in the arm and like buckets of blood fall off this guy's arm, and then he uses the guy <laughs> as a body, and like all these all these dub centers are like shooting. <laughs> and it's just shooting the guy's body. It's like, and that one hillbilly was like, "Da Django, Da Django." It's like the D is silent hillbilly, and it shoots him, in, it shoots him in the head. Oh yeah, um, yeah I, I found like, I reckon we could have done without like uh, the whole bit where he talks his way out of that wagon at the end. Oh like, yeah, and Tarantino's doing the weird Aussie accent. Sorry, New Zealand accent. I think it was supposed to be a New Zealand <laughs> accent. <laughs> <laughs> and then he comes back and he, he gets his revenge and all that. Like, at the time when we have the big shootout, like, I was ready for the movie to end at that point. I was like, you know. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was like, they kill Leo, have the big shootout, make it that he wins instead, and then he rides off. I, I would have been happy with that. <laughs> okay. <All laughs> I didn't right. think he needed I, I... to come back again, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um. I do like the I do like how Sam Jackson gets his comeuppance. Of course, I love how most action movies end with the hero walking away from the explosion. Django looks it right in the face and smiles. I just like the little bits of like that. You know, the house is blowing up and like he's got the cigarette in his mouth and the hand on his hips is cheesing because he's so happy of what he's pulled off. But I think something else yeah. we talk. I think we noticed with the Tarantino as a filmmaker is that in all of his films, at least from ones I've seen, there's usually that one character that just keeps the energy of the film just flowing the entire way through. You know, whether it be Han, Hans Landa in Glorious Bastards, or in my opinion, Steve Buscemi's character in uh, in I think his, his Mister Mister Pink, Mister Pink from yeah. Reservoir Dogs. Uh, I love that scene. By the way, why am I Mister Pink? <laughs> Can't we pick our own colors? No, no, no. I don't want to be Mister Black. Mr. Black. <laughs> Mr. Black. <laughs> uh, Mister Pink is like Mister Pussy. <laughs> 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 oh, oh man God. but like every and so but in Django Unchained it's um it's very much I think Leonardo DiCaprio that keeps the energy of the film flowing because oh, yeah. from the moment we meet Leonardo DiCaprio and the camera does that zoom in on his face that's great and then they have this conversation back and forth just he's so he's so committed and good to what mm-hmm. he does you watch like you watch him in like something like The Revenant or Wolf of Wall Street and then you see him in Django and you're like man he's so he has such range as an actor um, and he mm-hmm. in my opinion he's the reason like this movie keeps flowing all the way through so you i think you do kind of feel the void when he dies when he finally kills over yeah yeah but there's, i think it's it, you've still got the uh the comeuppance of samuel l jackson as a bad guy but my yes. god samuel l jackson how good was he in that movie i was like oh, my yes. god he really i really buy that he's like 80 in that yeah <laughs> you know he's 80 he's year the old hunch, the little walk and yeah has well, he feels evil, a lot like evil Emperor. Eye that he gives Django. I was like, ooh. Emperor Palpatine asks, like, like it's like because you, you feel like like throughout the movie, you're like, oh, okay, he's still the underling to Leonardo DiCaprio, and then you have that scene where they go like into the separate like library room or whatever, yeah. And then and then and then like the character that the just shifts the tone of his voice, the way he speaks, he goes from being the mm. senile old man to Samuel L. Jackson, and then you realize, oh, so it's like a Palpatine thing. He is he is subtly controlling Leonardo DiCaprio, even if Leo doesn't see it that way um, mm. yeah 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 but but it's, it was upset it's when dicaprio died <laughs> oh yeah well he <laughs> felt like, like no Kevin. well i think it's because you realize his control was over i think that's what he was like because he's like he was yeah. the white oh, man that true. like yeah. you know because and you know white men be like oh shut up blackie but this sorry i don't i don't like saying that like that word <laughs> but, oh, but God. Leonardo, it's like sorry. <laughs> yeah. but Leonardo dicaprio was the one that kind of like they were like they had like a father-son relationship-esque yeah. um yeah, 
I think it was interesting because Un- uh, Django Unchained came out like twelve months before Twelve Years a Slave, and uh, both both yeah. of them are of course like slavery movies. But w- yeah. this one is, is like Twelve Years a Slave is obviously harrowing and disturbing and really really powerful. Yeah. But this one is if much I'm more. I'm the only one that doesn't love that movie. I don't well, love Twelve Years a Slave like everyone else seems to do. It, it wasn't it's... the best movie nominated that year, but no. but anyway, but uh, I I because. Because Django is a really subversive and in some ways even darker film. Because you get a character like Samuel L. Jackson who's playing this kind of self-loathing slave in a sense. Who sort of kind of buys into the negative interpretation that is that has been forced upon his kind and culture, if that makes sense. He's, got, he's kind of bought into it and he's, he's using that to try and get a foothold at... at um, um, at DiCaprio's um, farm, and yeah. then you get to, you get a character like DiCaprio who just initially just comes across like just uh, you're the guy who thinks he's so charming and is just so wonderful and so yeah. brilliant. But because of yeah. the movie that he's in, it really gives a whole new dimension to the character as just an absolute scumbag. Yeah, is yeah. someone who is just so despicable and disgusting, who is just the scum on my boot, and you want him off the face of this planet. But yeah. DiCaprio is so naturally charming. It it's such a great subversion. It takes all of the the themes and and everything that that comes from that terrible period in American history, and p- pun intended, chains it to the Western yeah. exploitation genre. Yeah. And, and it's think, got and it's got a yeah. he's got a he's got a Cersei Lannister thing going on with his with his sister as well from what at least from what i was under the impression yeah. of because like you know he see him talk with his sister and and they get all they get kind of you know close and I'm like ah what's going on there but then it's yeah. the south so <laughs> that happens <laughs> yeah. that happens in the south well i don't know um, truly um because we talked about this after um hateful eight came out but in hateful eight um samuel L. jackson's character was originally going to be Django. He was, and yeah. as interesting as that would have been, I think that kind of would have tainted everything that Django does in this film. Yeah. <laughs> hashtag, yeah. hashtag warm black, warm black Zenas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's why he changed it because he said in Hateful Eight he wanted it to be you don't really know who the good guy is, but yeah. um, there he thought one. if Django's no, in there, everyone's going to go, oh, he's the good guy, even if he did force yeah. a guy to yeah <laughs> do, do do that uh, take out his black pecker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, and Start to see I think pictures, the, you? <laughs> oh god, that is that is a brilliant scene. I think I was trying Sandra to. Jack, I was trying to take a, Jackson should have been nominated. I was trying to take a swig of water, and you guys kept caught the scene. I always spit it out of my microphone every time. <laughs> oh but, man, yeah, Samuel L. Jackson should have been nominated for Django Unchained. I, I'm not just saying that because of Oscar So White. He genuinely was amazing in that film. Mm. But anyway, uh, yeah, and I think the standout scene in Django Unchained is the scene at the dinner table when um, when Brumhilda yes. gets taken out, and DiCaprio's got the skull, and the oh, way he man. when he's got the skull, and he's just talking about that weird dint on the back of it, and he somehow. Yeah uses that to justify his irrational hatred for African Americans and like you just think that may seem cartoonishly villainous but you you do see stuff like that nowadays like oh this one minor biological thing means that whites are superior or men are yes. superior or whatever yes. you, it's it's coming from a real place and that makes it even darker and of course he slams his hand down cuts his hand on the glass but keeps going like an absolute trooper and Watch just for good measure smears face. it yes yeah, smears it on through face that. <laughs> Oh, what how a do you sport. not? How do you not like freak? Like I, I can just picture Tarantino behind the camera oh. just being like, shh, 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 don't say anything because I'm sure Kerry Washington immediately wanted to stand up because like oh. her reaction is just like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, so that was right. a gen. You could tell it was a genuine reaction, kind of like how Absolutely. in. Um, Kind of like how in Hateful Eight, when Kurt Russell breaks the antique guitar, and now that company yes. that loaned them the guitar yeah. no longer rents guitars for movies anymore. That's right, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? Yeah, because that yeah, actress, yeah. When, when he smashes it, the actress is like, whoa, whoa! Yeah, she does break character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Tarantino's good for that. Um, yeah, but I Music overall think I'm over. Smash. <laughs> great bit. <laughs> <laughs> that over there ain't no lady. <laughs> I love that. I like that movie too. We'll get to that. We'll get to that later on. But um, Django Unchained itself is uh, it, it's probably still my favorite Tarantino film. 
And uh, going through all these favorite bits of ours definitely keeps it up. I think you talk about some of the things that define Tarantino as a filmmaker. One of the great scenes is, you know, the scene where they finally hunt down all three of the brothers and one's getting away on a horse. And you get that great shot of, you know, of uh, what's the – is it Schultz? King Schultz is the name of the – uh, Dr. King Schultz. Dr. King Schultz. Yeah, when he's when he's tracking him with the gun, and then he and then he shoots, and you get the shot of the blood on the white flowers or on the cotton yeah. or whatever, and you're like, wow, that's a great, that's awesome. Um, I, I I'll give you the bit with the um the uh with the uh, the slave owners when he's stuck in the cage. You probably could have cut that out, but I think that builds to an even greater finale. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's, I, he's I really not, like. He's that. like everyone talks about like uh, you know Zack Snyder or whatever as a visual director. But I think, like, Quinn Tarantino is a real visual director. Like, well, it, there's another yeah. shot in Django, like, earlier, where it's just a shot of a street where, like, people are leading, like, slaves around on, like, a chain chain gang or whatever it is, you know, where they're all connected, like, neck to neck to neck. But he yeah. does it as, like, the shots, like, from above. Mm-hmm. So there are these lines of, of slaves being led and, like, the word where he's got where, it, you know, the text coming up of where it is. But just visually, like, anyone else would just shoot that on the street. But like that he has it above and the way it's all set up, I was like, wow, that's really clever. Well, they're just like, – it's it's little details like that that I think make the film stand out for me. Like, like yeah. I've seen that movie probably six or seven times and when I went back and rewatched it a couple of months ago for the show, I, I, I was – it was amazing how I was still just blown away by certain things. And, and, and granted, you know, you do feel the length of the movies. When a movie is three hours long – even if it's like something like Wolf of Wall Street, which is one of my opinion, one of the best movies ever, something like Wolf mm-hmm. of Wall Street, which is three hours long, you still feel the length sometimes. But it's a matter of like if you can feel it and then just not care, I think is what yeah. really makes the, something like that stand out. Like if, if the length is justified, like, it, like in Wolf. Off of Wall Street, I don't think it wastes a minute of screen time. I just do think that no. Django could have could could have just had a, a couple of trims here and there, not a total uh, reworking, not a Zack Snyder ultimate cut or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I but I think that because I I think this is still a great film, and we've got to talk about the Ku Klux Klan scene. Oh my gosh, yes! <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how to, every time I have to explain to my friends, I'm like, so my, one of my friends is like, how, what makes Django and, Django and Chainsaw Grid out? We say they make the Ku Klux Klan funny, yeah. really genuinely hilarious. <laughs> and I, I don't want to quote what they say because we're trying to be family friendly on the show. <laughs> but they, they bring up the some bags good was points. a nice they're idea. Like, yeah, they're like, yes. we can't we can't see where we're going with these bags on our head when we're riding. <laughs> it's really, and you think about it, you're like. Yeah, it must be really hard to see. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, like well, that's where we're like, it's like, remember the one guy uh, Tarantino has the camera. I think that, I think that's Tarantino when you're playing. It's like it was a good idea in theory, but we could agree that it could be done better. I say we go without the bags. The next time we go full regalia, <laughs> and then Jonah Hill makes a cam. Jonah Hill makes a cameo as one of the guys. It's like I think I broke yeah, my mask. Jonah Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone bring an extra bag? No, no one brought an extra bag. I'm just isn't, asking. Isn't he the one who's like, my wife was making these hoods all day. No, no, you he's, the, he's, the one, he's the one that tore it. He's the one that tore his and messed his up. <laughs> that seems great. <laughs> and then they're all running away. At that, when else starts blowing up, the guy, well, I guess, I guess you should have this thing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> for, for some reason, that that reminded me of um. There's a South Park episode called "Here Comes the Neighborhood." When um, uh, do do you, any of you to watch South Park? Uh, I watched the not, movie not from religiously, this week. but I, okay, I like okay. It, yeah. well, the, well, there's a kid in in the series called Token, and he's called Token because he's the only black kid. Black, so he, huh? He's the yeah, yeah. black. <laughs> yeah, and um, and there's a. And it's really funny because there's an episode where a bunch of um, of celebrities start moving into South Park and it just happens that all of them are black, like Will Smith and his family, Snoop Dogg and his family. And what they do is that they say, oh, what we need to do, we need to dress up as ghosts to scare them away. And then they put, they, they put, it, they put a cross on the, on the front lawn and set fire to it. And they, they, they don't think of it as a cross. They think of it as, a, as the letter T. And the T stands for time to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so Probably funny. The South Park and what, guys would do that. And what, and what happens oh, is that God. one of the black celebrities comes out of their house, sees the the ghost with the tea on fire, and he's like, "A tea, time to leave." Like he knows what that's meant to mean. <laughs> oh man! Do, do they make what a joke about? Do they make about a joke about that the, the uh, you know in the clan hoods their boys in the hood or something like that? 
I can't remember. Because uh, maybe. Well, I mean, what would you expect? Because that's a prime real estate had... for that joke, boys from the hood. Because <laughs> they're literally expect... in the hood. <laughs> from the guys that had, that had Satan and Saddam Hussein have a gay relationship. I mean, what do you expect for those two? From those guys? <laughs> Zeta, I, I watched... your ass is gigantic I... and red. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I going to pretend you are? Liza Minnelli? (laughs) (laughs) It's easy, okay? It's easy, okay? I love that movie. I watched it this week for homework. It's it's quite impressive. Um, That's really funny. Blame Canada. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. Uh, Everything's been going wrong since Canada came along. (laughs) That's an Oscar-nominated film. It is. It is. Yeah. I think. I think it's. It's very clever for what it does. Um, oh <laughs> okay. man. Okay, let's get back to Tarantino for, for that. Yes, question. that's. Um, have, have we covered all these movies? What are some of the ones? Absolutely not. We definitely. Pulp fiction. We haven't talked about Pulp Fiction. We haven't talked about Hateful Eight, or we did briefly. We, yeah, we also say we haven't said a word about Kill Bill yet, which I haven't seen. So I'll leave that to you. I love the action scenes. Part two is pretty boring. Hmm. <laughs> Mm. That's basically is, my, my recollection of it. Isn't it? Um, isn't it somewhere in Kill Bill you see uh, what is it called the Fox Force Five showing on the TV or something? Because remember no in idea. Pulp Fiction, Uma Thurman talks about she was in a pilot called Fox Force Five, and she was about these five girls that you know uh, all have like special. Yeah, you know, one is the bomb chick. One has knives. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like apparently somewhere in Kill Bill you see that pilot playing on the TV, which links in with Quentin Tarantino saying that all of his films happen in the same universe. <laughs> hmm. Isn't, so, it all, isn't it all kind of for like one company, like Big Big Red Apple or whatever the country is called? Like Big like Red Apple. I know they mentioned that. I know it's seen in Pulp Fiction. I'm not sure if it's in Reservoir Dogs, but I know it's also in The Hateful Eight. I think, I think someone says the line, uh, Rojos Panzanias or something like that, which means Red Apple. I think if I said my Spanish correctly. Okay. Oof, I'm only in some second year of Spanish. But sorry, go back to Kill Bill. <laughs> no, I was just going <laughs> to talk about how... Um, yeah, that theory that everyone's, it's all in the same universe. So um, that's why uh, Mr. B- What's the name of the guy who cuts off the ear in Reservoir Dogs? Is he Mr. Yellow? Or Mr. Green or? Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde. Like, Mr. Blonde is the brother of. Of Vincent Vega, yeah. Yeah, Vincent Vega. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know, I think everyone probably knows that theory by now. But so that would also mean that in that universe, though, uh, World War II ends very differently. Mm. It would, oh yeah, because it would end with Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, rather than Hitler blows up, Hitler blows up in a, or burns to death, whatever, in a hospital or not a hospital. Excuse me, a movie theater. My yeah. bad. And it's called yeah. corpse get shot at. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh yeah, that is World War Two would end differently. Yeah, I guess. What 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 year is this? Is Inglorious Bastards set in? Is it in the forties? Is it? It's in the forties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, in the forties. Yeah, the war wow, years. Okay. Yeah, right up, right up. <laughs> okay. Um, do you guys have any further thoughts on Kill Bill? I've never seen it, so I can't speak for it. Um, I guess I'll leave that to you two. Um, I, I do you have any? I don't really know. <laughs> I've not seen it for a while. Like, Volume 1 is a legitimate, leg- a legitimately awesome action film. That When she fights the crazy 88 single-handedly, is, it's an amazing sequence of great music. But yeah. Volume 2 is just a load of talking. And it's a, but it obviously that's a lot of Tarantino's films, but it's talking without much direction. I, I just yeah. don't remember much about it. All right, it just it just seems to be meandering around for about two hours before, like before anything seems to happen. I, I don't know. I guess the, I probably need to revisit it. But Volume One is is legitimately worth watching. Well, apparently, All right. apparently he has left the door open for another, a third Kill Bill, which will be centered around uh, the daughter. Of the chick, because remember, like Uma Thurman kills what's her name, like Vivica uh, A. Fox, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then the is girl, she in that movie? The, girl sees right. it. the daughter sees yeah, it. She... And Uma Thurman says, yeah. "Didn't want you to see that. If it comes to a point where you can't handle it anymore, you can come and find me." So he was mm-hmm. making the volume three would be that chick looking for Uma Thurman for revenge. That'd be pretty cool. And then she I could kill like Uma this. Thurman yeah, in front say. of Uma Thurman's kid, and then that kid can go after her in volume uh. four. <laughs> It's like it's like it's like poetry. It's like, it's like it rhymes. 
Hopefully it's all about work. it's all about the feet, you know. You have to make sure all the feet are. I don't know. I wouldn't joke her on that. I wouldn't joke her instead of George Lucas. Sorry. All it takes is one bad foot to drive the sanest <laughs> mental lunacy. All it takes is one Jackie Brown to turn the whole thing. <laughs> Just, all it takes is one divorce to make Jackie Brown. <laughs> oh, Jackie Brown! That movie sucks. There's only one good bit. And that's where, like, you you see like one flash of the Quentin Tarantino, like edginess, which is uh, Robert De Niro's in it, and yeah. he's walking through his car park. He's looking for he's looking for his car, and he's got like uh, his friend's like annoying girlfriend there with him, and she's like just nagging him, nagging him. Well, you don't know where the car is, you idiot. And he's like, just just stop, okay? Just don't say anything more. And she's like, oh, gee, sorry. And he's like, no, really, just. Don't say anything more. She's like, fine. And he just goes, bang! And he just turns around and just shoots her. <laughs> like, because he's like, he doesn't even raise his voice. He's like, just just stop, please. I can't hear anymore. And then he just turns around and goes, bang! <laughs> That's the one time in that whole movie where you're like, yeah, Quentin! Well, I've seen <laughs> reviews, and a lot of people have problems with um, with movies like Django and the hateful eight because they have such violent third acts but i think that's what makes it film like i think that's what make tarantino films so great because reservoir, reservoir dogs is like that to an extent where it all it, it's always about the ticking clock you know the ticking time bomb if you will and once it goes off you get this barrage of just excellently done just gore and, and guts and just an explosion but it's not just about the gore it's about the gore happening to the characters the reason that we love our at least the reason that I love the third act of The Hateful Eight is because we've just seen an hour and a half of these guys sitting in a room and having conversations so that now when the rest of the movie is, okay, someone's just been shot in the balls and they have to figure out what happens next, you know, it's, it's – <laughs> You know, it gives it gives you a sense of oh, okay. I need, I really I'm invested in what's going to happen next because I know what these characters are all about. Something that a lot of movies really don't tell, like don't do anymore is is have good characters. And it's always refreshing to see Tarantino make his movies about the characters. That's what movies supposed to be about. But yeah, I think like I mean, there's lots of gore. He goes goes all in with it. But it's mm-hmm. a lot of it's like well, maybe some of it's just gore for the sake of gore. But most of the time, it's not. Like remember in. Um, in Hateful Eight, where Senior Bob has his face exploded by those bullets. Yes. <laughs> and it's awesome, because his face just goes... When he gets shot. And Kurt shot. Russell is just, is just vomiting blood. Yeah. I all love over that. Jennifer I, Jason I, Lee. I said it, that, that was, that's probably the only time I can see a vomit scene and not feel like I've just been disgusted, because it was done, ironically enough, and funny enough, so tastefully, pun intended, it was done so tastefully, <laughs> so that when the, when the vomiting scene happens and Kurt Russell's vomiting to Jennifer Jason Lee's mouth, and you're just like, I'm not grossed <laughs> out by this. I'm not gross. I guess, because it's exactly I guess it was happened. done tastefully, just all That's over the mouth. I didn't. T- <laughs> yum yum said. yum. Yeah, but it's but like true. even the, the point is like even in a moment like that where Senior Bob's face gets shot off, there's a reason for it in the story. Because later on when they're negotiating, he's like, "Well, I can't claim the bounty on that guy now because he's got no face." Yeah, exactly. So like and, even uh, even when there's gore like that. There's still reason for it in the story. <laughs> it's great to see Channing Tatum get shot in the back of the head and it's have like his, his head face just, just explode, <laughs> explode all over Jennifer Jason Lee. It's just, just like oh, and that's then she awful. freaks out. She doesn't freak out when she gets vomited on. <laughs> no, she was <laughs> smiling. Remember, that, that, that's because it's her brother, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, and so you just see her brother's like Chan- Chan- Sam's head just speaking of which forgot he was in it when he showed up by the way for going to the hateful eight because you know you have, you have him in the credits like and Chenny Tam or whatever and then but then and yet, the camera pans underneath the floorboards and you see Chenny Tam and we're like oh that's right he's in this movie and then it goes back and figures out how everything happened and once again doing that classic Tarantino ask him yeah. I feel like but it's, if anything, it's great to watch it again when you know who everyone is. Yes. there's all this extra stuff. Like, she comes in, she's like, the sheriff of Red Rock's traveling with us because she's letting them all know that there's other people out there, so they can't yes. shoot him yet. So <laughs> once you know everything, there's a whole second layer to it. Sorry I interrupted. No, you're fine. No, it, it's like, I'm going to your point, Tim Roth, who I think we haven't talked about at all, but he showed up in a couple of his films. Uh, I think he's also, he's in Pulp Fiction and he's in Reservoir Dogs. Uh, you know, Tim Roth is great as the, uh, I, I forget his name, but I'm just going to call him the guy's Frontier Justice because uh, he gets that's my favorite <laughs> of his. Well, um, just like, well, well, Walter you Goggins. by the is, neck until dead. <laughs> that isn't Walter Goggins in Django Unchained? 
Yes, he's the he's the hillbilly that keeps calling him Django. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but yeah. he gets I, he's I Ringo love that. Ringo from Pulp Fiction. He is he is Thanks, also Thanks, Honey Bunny. Pulp that guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, he is. Isn't <laughs> yeah. He? <laughs> yeah, and uh, he's Mr. Orange in uh in Pulp in uh, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. Tim Roth. Yeah, he's yeah. the cop. Spoiler. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that that was great. <laughs> by the way, when it's like, oh my god, oh, just, that was a great twist. Um, and I again, I love Steve Buscemi in that film. I think he's he's the standout for me because I think he gets all the best lines. He gets all the best interactions. <laughs> my way or the highway, Jesus, Joe, forget about it. It's whatever. I'll say it's whatever when it's whenever. I love the interaction with you. <laughs> Anyways, back to the hateful eight. Yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh well. My Sorry, brain's scattered. I, I derailed. My brain's scattered. It's all right. <laughs> My brain's gone. Nope, it's still gone. For I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that bit in Reservoir Dogs as well, where uh, once you learn that that guy's the undercover cop, and that dude's like, that dude's like telling him, he's like, look, every criminal has a funny story that they tell each other. You need to figure out your funny story and tell it over and over and over and over and over, so that it's natural and it's a real thing in in your head. And I was like, that sounds like something that they would actually teach these undercover guys in real life. Seems pretty yeah. plausible to me. <laughs> well, I, well, people do that in their normal lives at all. Like, people can come up with lies or, 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 or tell – like when you tell a story, you forget certain things so that you fill it in with lies and eventually the lies become the truth. That's a real thing that happens. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's right because – I mean, we're getting a little bit off track here, but yeah, they've found they've done studies on that for like memory recall, and they say every time you replay a memory, it changes a little bit, and you fill in the blanks. So, if it's something that you've replayed in your head over and over and over and over and over, you know, twenty years later, it might be completely different than what actually happened. I know because oh. NerdSync did a video about like, does Batman really remember what happened with his parents in that alley? Because every time he replays that memory in his head, it changes a little. You know. Oh, that's so depressing. That's so depressing. You might have it oh. totally wrong now, you know? <laughs> well, could you imagine it's like his parents were actually like hit by a car and he's just like, no, criminal <laughs> stuff from us. <laughs> Superman, I'm, I'm pretty Superman sure it reverses time driver. and it's like completely yeah. different. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a drunk driver or they just happen not to look both ways and cross the street. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah. It's weird. Though. Are you like, okay? If you've, if you've ever... Over there, it's uh, the same. It like is, if you've, if you've it ever is seen... ten to one. I'm sorry, go <laughs> on. No, no, we were so, just asking what time it was because yeah, it, it must it, be it's, te- it's ten to one, and my girlfriend is asking for the room. All right, <laughs> <laughs> we better wrap up. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let's talk about, and we'll give a couple of listener questions to, and we'll, we'll close off. Pulp the show Fiction's here. awesome. There we Pulp go. Fiction. We've oh, talked yeah, about Pulp Fiction. Fiction. What's, what's well, we talked about it before on the show. What's Quentin's next movie that he's doing? I think he said he wants to write a novel, didn't he? Yeah, I want to see about Hateful Eight too. Because well, like, once he's done ten films, uh, he's he's done more than ten. But let's count Hateful Eight as his eighth film. Once he's done ten films, he wants to retire and like write a book on filmmaking and do stuff and like write history books and stuff. Um, but I don't think he's actually announced his ninth film yet. I don't think he's made um, made it known. I think he, he's he wants want to like t- a, give me like a nineteen twenties gangster film. Mm. Yeah, he'd be good at that. Yeah, give him something like because you know I I don't want to see another western, but I don't want to see another I don't want to see like a twenty fifteen esque film from him either. I don't I don't really want to know what future Tarantino looks like though. Then again, it could be something pretty crazy because technically Mad Max is set in the future, so yeah. I would like so maybe maybe some maybe future Tarantino could be really could be pretty cool. What about like, a, a Tarantino Viking movie? Oh, cool. oh man! <laughs> if if, <laughs> if you Google um... movie or something. Maybe if you Google apartment, Tarantino yeah. next movie, one of the results that uh, one of the auto uh, suggestions for Google is James Bond. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. <laughs> it's, I, I, you know, you know, it would be great though. The opening titles for that movie would be awesome because because he would he he would use he would use an old song and then like oh, imagine- man, <laughs> every time James Bond sleeps with somebody like a virgin plays. <laughs> 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 and then the but the title called the title song is su- is stuck in the middle with you and it's just pictures of ears <laughs> everywhere <laughs> ears of blood <laughs> the, the like the opening like the gun barrel would be like like three times as bloody like there'd be blood splatters on the screen it'd be all grainy and filmy oh man <laughs> oh man i actually really want to see especially after the boringness that was specter give me some life in the james bond movie again yeah oh man no i'm definitely looking forward to see what quentin does in the future though no doubt about it yeah. okay um, uh, his, his, let me see uh, a legitimate his next idea sorry, sorry. 
His next idea, apparently, according to an interview with The Independent, is a Bonnie and Clyde-ish sort of story set with a couple of outlaws in Australia. That's an idea that apparently yes. he's had. Sweet. Whether, yes. Whether or not that's Sick. his next film, that's oh not confirmed. Don't want, don't want Cinema Blend to you know run with that story. Oh, I wonder if he's doing his <laughs> version <laughs> of Ned Kelly. Please That'd be us. great. Huh? <laughs> I wonder if he's doing his version of Ned Kelly. That'd be awesome. No idea mm. who that is. No, no, he's he's like the Aussie Robin Hood, but oh, he's okay. he's famous because he actually like he fought all the cops who were all British cops and all that. But okay. um, he actually armored himself up. He actually <laughs> like the helmet that he used. It's like it looks like a bucket with the eyes cut out, sort of thing, like in a rectangular. It, it sounds stupid when I'm describing it, I, but it was really cool. I'm just going back to the Django and Chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, no, he just, was just, just like a walking Im- tank. This guy, you know, he just yeah, just out imagine the. Imagine the first act of Iron Man, but it's in Australia. Yeah. That sounds... <laughs> that I could would, be great. Yeah, I look forward to that. Bonnie and Clyde set in Australia sounds really awesome, especially with Tarantino doing it. I can just picture the opening scene being set in a car with those two just talking to each other. Oh, man. Because I think that's a, that's a love story set in... Oh, man. Oh, man. That'd be so awesome. And then Tarantino would just have a field with the scene where they get shot by the car. That's a... Oh, man. Oh man! <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm sorry, thinking about it. Again. All right. Um, so should should we should wrap we up? Because Trilby's gonna. <laughs> should we move on to listener questions? Because I had listener questions. Yeah, let's let's, let's go that. for it. Okay. All right, guys. Listener questions time. Excuse me. I'd like to ask you a few questions. All right, guys. So this is our listener questions portion of the show. In which case, uh, on our Facebook page, we we do a giant uh, we do a post where we say ask our listener questions about today's topic. Uh, the best ones get run in the show. And our first one here comes from a uh, uh, classic fan of the show, Shazeb Ali. Asks, "How is it like being a YouTuber? Any tips?" And we've gotten this question before, so I guess we should keep it brief. But I feel like it's time to revisit it every now and then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you want to know what it's like to be a YouTuber, there's a website called Social Blade where you can type in any YouTuber's name and it gives you the stats of all their channel, including how much money they make. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my friend makes showed... about a million dollars a month. <laughs> Lucky what? bastard. It was four million a year, like a like last like last October. Oh, all right. So all right. It's funny because it gives, it gives, like, a wide, cause it, it gives like a wide um, range. On mine, it says I make between thirty seven dollars a month and nine hundred dollars a month. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> That's a pretty wide range. Well, um, well, PewDiePie, according, he, according he to my, kicked, um, you you make eight dollars a month. It says <laughs> me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was gonna say between it makes it makes it, like, I said between eight and one hundred twenty two. I'm like, I have I've not gotten a and single truly, cent of that. Yours, you've got two channels that said each one of them makes about a hundred a month. So I wish uh, <laughs> because pu- bloody WTFU, WTFU. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, PewDiePie got kicked out of his apartment like a few weeks ago because his um, his on camera shrieking apparently sounded like uh, like um, uh, like gay sex or something. So his landlord kicked him out, and PewDiePie yeah. was like, "I could buy this building if I wanted to," and he probably could. So he yeah. just moved apartments. <laughs> Why would he have to be kicked out of his side? Like, you know what? Never mind. Never mind. Uh, to answer That's the question, the what's like to be what it's like to be a YouTuber? It's 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 not it's just i don't know i'm not like i don't do it for a living i just kind of do it because i like doing it so i guess to answer from that perspective it's just like you do something that you enjoy and then you put it out there and if it's good enough i guess people will watch it and comment on it um it's good and it's bad because you often get things like man i can't wait for you to come out there and actually make movies or i'm happy that i got you gave your opinion on this and then you get things like oh my god he's such a stupid n-word and why is he even here this kid doesn't know what he's talking about so you know you, you get your your goods and your bads but i think it's a lot of fun and if you're smart enough you can get yourself at age 15 and talk to a, to talk to a big youtuber like Bandit incorporated <laughs> if you know if you know how to do business <laughs> um yeah well, That's I think I think being a YouTuber is bloody awesome, mate. <laughs> it, I mean, it is. It's it bloody is. It's just, awesome. It's like I once, once, you like point, the... once you get to the point. Once you get to the point where you can depend on that for a job as well, where you can do yeah. YouTube full time, it's fantastic, man. Because I, I work at home. The whole of the rest of my life, I've always had like outdoor jobs and stuff like that. And you know, 
in the hot summers, in the rain and all that kind of stuff. So to be able to be safely cocooned inside and to just, well, apart from when we do the podcast, I can just get up whenever I want, go to bed whenever I want. It's fantastic, mate. <laughs> the best part about this is that just the Skype cut out when you were saying that. It's like, so you can, whenever you want. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like, you, you know, the Skype cut out right there. I'm like, oh, that's that's lovely. Yeah. So um, okay. once, you get, once you get to that point, it's pretty awesome. Um, mm. It's a lot of grinding before you get there, though, and a lot of yes. like experimenting and trying different things, and yeah. If you're mm-hmm. taking an AP class in high school, it's not the most fun thing to do because you're like, oh man, I worked, I worked for three days on this Walking Dead review, and I and I just got done with my AP homework. I had to read two, I had to read thirty pages out of this AP textbook. Oh, what a relaxing time! I can't wait to post this. And then you get thirty comments about how you need to die in a hole because you didn't like this episode of The Walking Dead. Sometimes it can be a <laughs> bit of a buzzkill. You just want to lay down and die. You're like I'm gonna take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's uh, actually I, um, no, but I I reckon if if anyone's got an interest in YouTube, um, just get involved. Just start away. Anyone can start a YouTube channel, and yeah. um, in the early days, experiment as much as you can uh, until you sort of find your thing. Mm. And um, yeah, that's, that's one thing I yeah, must but, also if, say but, that I, I'm I, trying I, to reclaim I, my channel now because no, I'll <laughs> cause let I, you. I, I didn't upload because my channel dropped and dropped and dropped as I was doing that Star Wars. So it's yeah. kind of stagnated now. So now it's mission yeah. of reclaim Bandit Incorporated. So yeah. I'm just mm-hmm. trying to like <laughs> I'll let you pop out as many videos. Show, but, I want to get up to hundred thousand. I'd like How to say you? something, <laughs> but I what I can say is it, when you when you, if you do ever start doing YouTube and you do get big enough, don't use your channel as a way to spread the hatred. Because it's one thing I've noticed on YouTube in the last like two months or so. There's just been this ongoing round of just hating on things, whether it be Ghostbusters or other YouTubers. You know, you, you, you need to understand also that my hating video. <laughs> well, my, I well I think my Ghostbusters you give your video. <laughs> You give your opinion, and you're and and not to be racist, but you know Australians can be a little angry um, sometimes. You, you you're very you can be a very angry people, and so it's like it's so you're giving your opinion. Uh, I think, I think you it's a bit opinion. of the co- the pot calling the pet did the pot calling the kettle black in that case, my friend. <laughs> what you just say to me? <laughs> I'm I'm saying you're both racist. <laughs> No, but just be just be careful with what you say and what you do. I mean, bed it's dying over here. <laughs> And that's why we do this podcast because we have fun. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. you if, if you want to, if, if you want to succeed on YouTube immediately, react to stuff, yes. put red arrows and red yes. circles in your thumbnails, <laughs> and watch the dollar dollar roll in. Mm. Yes, <laughs> or um, that, that, that's all you, I can. Contribute. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what would take off. I just saw the other day. There's there's a girl. Her whole channel is um, just her eating food. It's just is like she this, hot? It, yeah, is it's just this hot? pretty, That's pretty why. Asian girl. Three videos a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And she's just sitting there with the camera. And she's just eating, never says a word. And they're like strangely hypnotic because everyone's like, yeah, I wonder what she's having for breakfast today. You know, and- ASMR <laughs> is a thing. You know, ASMR, they, it was without angry people, the thing where people are just like, Let's talk this close to the mic. And then they say things and then they want to make noises with their mouths. <laughs> that stuff, yeah. that is a thing. And that is a big thing out here on the internet. I'm like, first of all, I hate the sound of anybody eating on microphone at all. I hate the sound yeah. of people eating in real life. We've been over this. Um, hold on, I'm getting a phone call. Gonna no get no that. idea <laughs> is too stupid for YouTube. That's, that's no. the moral of it. Try everything try everything especially when your channel's smaller because you can get yeah. away with trying stuff that pe- your audience aren't used to because you've got a smaller audience just know? keep this in mind keep people listen to to three idiots behind a microphone talk about stuff for upwards of three hours so just you know yeah. you know you'd be surprised what people are going to like um but let's truly, we, what, what's your take on it sorry um I'd say for, for me, I'm in a really awkward place because uh, what many people do is that they work their normal jobs, their nine to fives, and then they do YouTube as a hobby and build that up until they can do it, do it as a proper career. Mm. Um, because I work in the media industry, I tend to work. I don't work a nine to five. I work a seven till seven. I work a eight till ten. I work a six a.m. to midnight kind of job, which means it's really hard to kind of get that balance and also you know interact with human beings day to day. Um, which is one reason why um, I've not had much content recently. So it's just, it's not for everyone. It's just, it's not going to work out for everybody, but um, I'm at that awkward stage where I don't have a massive enough audience to make a living from it, but I do have a big enough audience that they, um, that um, I've got a, 
a pretty um, reasonable following of people and people um, who really enjoy my content and, and, and I'm really appreciative of that and, and mm. so that's really all I can say really um, yeah. I just I do it um, when I've got the time to do it but um, if you want to succeed with YouTube analytics and their system you need to regularly upload you need to have long videos you need uh, viewer retention you need um, topical stuff and that um what you're good at is not necessarily what's popular on YouTube and yes. just trying to find that balance um, mm. may be difficult for some and it's not for everyone, but it, it's worth trying. It's worth giving it a go. And um, when you're a student at university, I highly recommend having a hobby and a YouTube channel is a very good hobby. Yeah. And also monetize no matter how big or small your channel might be. Cause like I've noticed a couple of other channels, they're like, oh, I don't want to monetize. And I'm like, we well, should, because even if it's only like, you know, a couple dollars a month, it doesn't Point matter. Point zero adds... two cents for every view. <laughs> yes. But it doesn't matter because it adds up until it reaches a threshold and then it will pay you out. So, yes. you know, it's, it's worth it. It's money in your pocket that you wouldn't otherwise have. And plus now with YouTube Red, the, the pay system... Yeah, can put more money in your pocket if you're a smaller... Yes, I've been noticing that. I looked at my analytics, and I'm not going to say how much, but I can tell you that uh, I was like, I'm like, I don't usually get, uh, I don't usually get this much, you know, uh, 40 cents every instead month. of 8. Yeah, every month from YouTube Red, I get 88 cents a month from YouTube Red. <laughs> it is not a big difference. <laughs> but look, if you're... If you're... If you're under the age of 18 or whatever the legal age is in America, I don't know whether it's 18 or 21, but here it's 18. If you're under the age of 18, if you're going to show your face, don't use your real name and don't say where you're from. <laughs> you know. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> because there's some weirdos out there just saying. Oh, tell me about it. I remember, I remember <laughs> yeah, when you I know. first told my mom. I remember when I first told my mom that I was... <laughs> I was that I was when I was recording with Bandit Incorporated. I remember I remember her reaction was she wasn't happy. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, remember we cool had that conversation now. where I I thought you were like twenty. And then in the podcast on like the fourth episode, <laughs> yeah. you mentioned you that you're sixteen, and I was like, ooh. What? Oh, what? No. <laughs> I was like, I could get in trouble now. <laughs> you think I'd be on Law and Order? I like to. <laughs> so your head's on the chopping block too, Trilby. So. <laughs> uh, <I'm, laughs> it it was only. <laughs> it was only a matter of time. I mean, but Trilby, Trilby's like like what? Twenty four? How old are you? Twelve? How old are you, Trilby? Twenty four. You're yeah. like twenty four. So it's not. <laughs> gonna say bad. Bad. Four. Like, I'm thirty four. I was gonna say yeah. that's like sixty. So it's 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 a bit stranger. But Shut I don't know. <laughs> 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 I love I love like whatever we had to explain what a hashtag is. I love how people were like hashtag hashtag explained <laughs> in the comments. I knew I what that. a hashtag was. I just wasn't sure whether you create it like a like in Facebook well, you have to create a page for here's something. Here's the thing though. Is that you, 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 we joked about that, but when I was at work like a week or two afterwards, somebody was saying, do you have to create a hashtag? Do you have to buy a hashtag? It, it's, I was mm. kind of surprised how people I, outside of, um, of like the Twitter <laughs> sphere, so to speak, didn't know what a hashtag was or assumed you had to buy one. Yeah. And, and that, so makes that was kind of surprising. On, Bandit, you're not on Instagram or, or you're, and you don't, you don't use Twitter as much as you use something like you do a Facebook page. So it makes more sense that no. you don't know how, that you don't know exactly how to use a hashtag correctly. I can guarantee that you got, you probably don't know how to use Snapchat because I don't know how to use Snapchat. So oh. um, um, like only one, only one percent of the audience will get this, but um, how do you use Snapchat? You just use Snapchat. That's how you use Snapchat. You just use Snapchat. Is that a social network reference? Uh, no, it's uh, it's a BBC reference. How do you Snapchat? You just Snapchat. Okay, right on. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, not you know what? I didn't get that. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna close. You know, we should close off here. <laughs> I got one Once last question. Gets- oh, uh, do we? Okay. Go Ag ahead, go Lestrange ahead. says, "Do you know the oh. Muffin Man?" The Muffin Man. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I know man. the Muffin Man who lives the on Drury Lane. Man. I was, I was well, she's strike, married but... to the Muffin Man. <laughs> the Muffin Man. The Muffin Man. <laughs> she's married to the Muffin Man. <laughs> You're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Eat me, you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good film look the there's so so many sure. questions here we'll have to we'll bank them all for next week how about we that? will legitimately bank them this time i know there's we only so we we'll bank them and i make up i make a new post i'm sure because like because like we started to see like like let me find it dean jones has has asked the same question five weeks in a row considering account about harry potter we'll answer that question next week dean I promise. and you need to watch <laughs> all so of the harry potter films before christmas <laughs> hmm? 
a bandit, you need to watch all of the Harry Potter films before Fantastic Beasts. Oh, God. That's what I was going to say next. <laughs> when are we going to start doing Harry Potter? Because if we, like, like we, if we would have done a month, we would have had to start back in April. So when are we going to, I don't know when we're going to start doing Harry Potter. I think my sister because, has all the movies on DVD. I'll get them. You can just find them online. But my thing is, it's like, like my, cause like, let's say you do like, it, there's eight movies. And if we do them a week apart, that's 16 weeks. That's like four months, but whatever. Um, anyways. I'll, I'll think, chip away at it. I'll do that. But, but yeah, look, to all our listeners, thank you so much for all these questions. We will hmm. answer each and every one of them in yes. turn. So don't worry, your question will not be wasted. We really yeah. do appreciate it. Yeah, we'll and save so, them and bank them yeah. over and we'll answer everyone's question. To those who might be upset that I pick questions, like, why can't I ask a good question? <laughs> they might be a little upset about that because people ask some legitimately awesome questions on here. I mean, we've got, we got like 20 of them on this one people post. Posting it's pictures. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's decided to choose the Muffin Man question. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like, like, uh, <laughs> I can see, okay, because I, I remember like when I would ask questions on film breads, I, I, how satisfying it is to hear your, hear people that you listen to every week say your name. Um, it's pretty satisfying. Yeah. Um, so. Hey, you may- mentioned that was coming back truly a few, a few weeks um, yeah, ago we've, yeah. Um, I, was, I was hoping to restart that um, because um, I was hoping to start that again in April um, but then I got this like 10 week job which was occupying all of my day and I, I just wouldn't have the time to do this podcast do my other stuff and that and I was thinking oh now I can, now I can bring it back now that I've finished that job um, I got another job offer I start on Monday so we'll see how that happens we'll see what those, <laughs> what those work hours are like but I want to bring it back because I do enjoy um, podcasts podcasting a lot but we'll see, we'll see how it goes but i've got a week off work now so i'm going to catch up on all the reviews i've not yet done and hopefully review ghostbusters and films like money monster that i watched weeks ago and have yet to review all right all right <laughs> sure. well uh what comes out next oh well, i guess oh do you want to you know well, we'll talk about this is ghostbusters air. that's what we're talking yeah about but, next week. but but i but we'll get i want to talk about that off air let me okay so sure. And with that, thank you all for watching. This has been another episode, another episode of Movie Mania talking all about Tarantino and some of the movie news from earlier today, uh, earlier this week. Uh, Trilby, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me online um, at www.trilby.com. That's T-R-I-L-B-E-E. You can find me on Twitter at Trilby Reviews. You can find my short film, The Christmas Detectives, at awardio.tv. There should be a link in the description below. Massively appreciate it if you could vote for that. And you can find my name in the, cre- in the credits of The Question Jury on Channel 4 at 4 p.m. on weekdays for this next month in the UK. So check it out. It's actually a really engaging game show. I recommend you watch it. So uh, that's me. Awesome. awesome. Uh, people can find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter as Bandit Incorporated, and they can find you. Trey? They can find me. Yes, they can find me on uh, YouTube's, Twitter, and Instagram, all at uh, Podcast Media. Um, and uh, time codes. Forgot to mention that at the start of the show. Uh, Alicia Malone will be here soon. Can promise that, guys. Uh, Join us next week. We're going to talk Ghostbusters. Catch you all later. Our movie maniacs. Oh, okay. sh- shall I do my own trailer reaction, like what Bandit does? Yeah, do a trailer reaction. Okay, by right, Nick Jonas <laughs> and James Franco. So, Bandit sounds so defeated. Oh my god. Okay, right, yeah, Bandit, you can nap. Like, yeah, you can, you can nap for two and a half minutes while I watch the trailer for Goat. All right, I know nothing about this movie, so I'm pressing play on the MTV link now. Oh, Nick Jonas, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> Get on with it. Yeah, awesome. He's introducing the trailer. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, he was introducing the trailer. It's all okay, about here we go. Oh, boys, isn't it? <laughs> Sundance selected, so you know it's good. What's so cool about the frat? Frat being part of a fraternity, anyway. Like, is it just the parties? I, 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 I think so. That's I, all they ever I talk about. Or is I it like? Been. You're schools, being part so of the Freemasons once you get out. Everyone's like, here, yeah, here's a job or something. Oh, not let you in. I don't know. <laughs> when does the goat come in? <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for the goat to show up. There's no goat in the trailer. <laughs> it just looks like um, a cross between Bad Neighbors and Spring Breakers. Yeah. I, I said it looks like a cross between Bad Neighbors and Zero Dark Thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Zero Dark Thirty? What? Yeah, he gets, he gets. Well, yeah, you haven't finished the trailer. Yeah. Okay, he's got, the, he's got the phone call with the death threat or something. This is just like a YouTube video. This is exactly what happens. It's just like, let's describe the trailer as it happens. 
Yeah. Well, this is audio. This so is I'm a kind terrible of like, reaction video, Trilby. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to watch it. You, you know what that means? It means you'd make millions of dollars. <laughs> Absolutely. Millions. Yeah, millions. So you make... I remember I did a, a trailer you reaction. Quietly, like... Watching it, you make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, well, I remember I did like... Oh, man, that was dope. Yeah, and then you make a oh. meme, make a character watch. That was beautiful. God's sake, now... Eggs. Yeah. <laughs> this basement stuff has reminded me of my college days. Uh, <laughs> sure, we gave me some Fight Club reactions. Mm. I, I dropped out like, of college. <laughs> I, I remember doing um, like some trailer reactions to the Super Bowl. Hold on, spot. hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go back. <laughs> and everyone was just really complaining because I was directly reacting to them. And we're talking about it. <laughs> I don't know where band, it just goes. Yeah, I dropped out of college. <laughs> <laughs> to try and like slide that in there. Right. <laughs> what Ruby what? said when he went to college, I was like, I went, I just didn't finish. So I mean, you didn't, you didn't say that though. You were just like, I dropped out of college. <laughs> you said it all, and if I get you're tired, you said it all sulking like, like, yeah. I, I think I, I was studying out. marketing or something like that. Can't remember. Oh, the only thing I remember something. about college is like the the three a.m. hot dog runs. Yeah, down the, down on the corner of the street was like this service station that had hot dogs, and we mm-hmm. just go hot dog round, and we'd all pile in car and go down there. <laughs> that's okay, all right. I remember I, about university. That's the one thing I remember about college, right? Huh? Yeah. Right, the, the, the trailer's over. Feel free to just edit that me watching it entirely out. But yeah, I think there's, I will. <laughs> uh, what's I'll include it at the, the end or something like that. <laughs> 